Yeah, it might be easier as well to put it sideways. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yep. You can hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. You can hear me. I pressed the record button. Mm-hmm. Um, but we can figure that out afterwards. I kind of jump in at the deep end and have a, and <laughs> I've no idea where it's going to go. Um, okay. But I kind of, I, let me see, do I have a kind of a start? Um, my sense is the rabbit hole <laughs> is very deep. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, in particular, obviously, we got in touch, uh, you know, we got in touch through the 5MEO movie. That's what mm-hmm. we interacted. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so obviously you've got interest in the <laughs> psychedelics and uh, all sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely, I have, yeah. And um, I suppose uh, we're, what, uh, what we've kind of, the, perhaps the conversation is around COVID today, but I don't know where it's going to go after that. And yeah. And the premise for that is, um, I'm kind of not really a conspiracy. I'm not a conspiracy theorist mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. I actually don't even like the language of that. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I, 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 but this particular thing that has happened mm-hmm. seems to be just glaring to to yeah. me. Now I had it back in March. Yeah. I had the, the virus, and I was mm-hmm. you know I was pretty sick. Mm-hmm. In the scheme of things, I had pneumonia a few years previous. Um, yeah, and. Um, so, uh, so it's pretty. Problem. What was that? So, say the respiratory virus is for you is potentially a problem anyway. It's, yeah, it, uh, that's absolutely the case. Now, my wife had it too, but that's probably because I had it, and um, mm-hmm. we'd say it was six weeks. And at the time, I was kind of going, "God, this is this isn't great." But I still kind of wasn't. Uh, I wasn't too impressed by how everything was locking down because I, I'm probably passionate most about freedom. And, mm-hmm. you know, freedom to stay in or freedom to go out, freedom to be scared, freedom not to be scared, just freedom. And yeah. um, and so, but I, I still kind of went along with, I mean, it was mass media coming at me. So I was saying, well, this must be a thing that's bad. Mm-hmm. And yet still yeah. I had this kind of doubt. And then I remember seeing back in March, Elon Musk saying, eh, I don't think it's so bad. And I was kind of in my arrogance going, ah, you're not looking at the maps here. Because I was looking at the maps going, well, a hundred cases, five deaths. That's five percent. That's that's pretty lethal. All the same, the yeah, scheme of all sure. things. So all I had was that top level data, and um, uh, but so I kind of went along with it, you know, blah blah blah. And but I I I, I kept going in the back of my mind, going, okay, well, why is this suddenly so different? I was kind of going, what's the fear thing? What's this nonstop, relentless fear? Yeah. Why, why is, you know, in a logical perspective, why are, people, why are we not talking about all the people that have recovered? Is that mm-hmm. not just something to do? And why are we not saying that really it's only the vulnerable who are really at risk and that we should be raising heaven and earth mm-hmm. to make sure they're okay? So yeah. un- unbelievably amazing things to protect the vulnerable in hospices and care homes. So and, and to put a lot of that money into treatments. I mean, let's be honest, if they'd put... If you'd sunk a billion into looking at treatment, are we supposed to believe there's no innovators out there that would have come up with, you know, specialist treatments and medicines that would help with people in the hospitals, you know, instead of this kind of what can only be called, a, you know, a myopic, intense focus on a vaccine, you know, whereas obviously if you, if you put that same money to companies to make therapeutic treatments, you know, for people that were critically ill, I mean, that to me would be a pretty sound investment, you know, it, it's been very myopic. Yeah, and it's the, it's that's exactly. I couldn't get my head around that, and I couldn't get my head around. But you know, you see, because I did work in the corporate world, and it's not kind of an excuse to go. No, if it gets too busy, we can't handle this. Mm-hmm. It's it's a case of oh, sorry, excuse me. Do you want to stay in your job, or do you want to handle this? So tell me what you need to handle it. Mm-hmm. How much money do you yeah. need? How much more room? How much more support? What do you need? But the last thing you do is, you know, you don't close down. You, no. you, and that was, that's kind of just an instinct. I, I was kind of, I'm, and maybe that's kind of just who I am. You, you kind of go, sorry, that just doesn't cut it now. You just, that's yeah. not an acceptable. So then I start, then you start going, I, I wanted to find out for myself. I actually don't believe, I was mm. saying this to somebody and they said it's, 
quite stark, but I don't believe one person on this planet. I, I mean, I actually do not believe anyone. I have to kind of go, and at least in, it has to be cornered in my own mind to go, well, this is the information there. This is the information that's available. So I, I went on to the statistics office to look to see, well, what is the medium age? And, I mean, it was only subsequently I did it with, I did a podcast with Ivor Cummins, who was, had okay. been ranting about it for a few months. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, in my mind, I'm, I'm still in the same position. I'm kind of going, especially now, you have all the information, why on earth would you lock down? And I also, so sorry, the last thing to kind of give this context is, mm -hmm. I, I'm also quite cynical of human nature and human nature getting comfortable with new ways and controls. I mean, I was stopped by a cop, ask, you know, this was a few months ago, asking you know, where I was going, but I was going outside the city limits. And I wanted to say to him, uh, neither one of us should get comfortable with the situation whereby you can ask me where I'm going or I feel it's okay that I should tell you. I, I kind of want to just have that chat, but obviously you're not going to have that. That was the kind of ruminations going on in my mind. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm going to say this to yeah. him if he says this or whatever. Yeah. So then obviously the more you look and uh, the more I have looked on the outside, I'm kind of going, okay, there's trillions of dollars at stake here trillions mm -hmm. and you can park that for a moment but it, i suppose it's the non-stop fear thing i just have a problem with that it's kind of yeah. it's like a, a, somebody co constantly comes with the problem mm -hmm. and not and the only solution is like sorry the last thing our, our head of state prime minister in an interview a couple of months ago goes well we're going to get 20 billion of debt to cover these few months and then hopefully we get the vaccine and if not, we, let, we should be able to get more debt to bring us to the mid of next year. And mm -hmm. I kind, I just go, that's not, that's not governance. That's not acceptable. Yeah. I don't find that acceptable. Forget any conspiracy theory, forget anything. And mm -hmm. again, conspiracy theory, as we know, is a way to dismiss any yeah. kind of yeah. uh, discussion. So already I have been called, because I'm looking at this, I'm being called a right winger now, which is phenomenal. Yeah. A granny that's hater, good. a granny hater. Uh, um, and blah 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 blah, and all I'm kind of going, isn't it a bit odd? Isn't, mm. Don't you find it a bit odd? And it's anyway. So Bruce, uh, in the, in my meanderings, I've I've followed you, and um, I'm kind of curious about this. It's like as if you've seen this coming. Yes, I mean, uh, in some respects, I mean, certainly from uh, early on, you know, around. March, April time, you know, I, I was starting to get very sceptical. Initially, you know, I think like a lot of people, you saw the videos in China, uh, you know, it looked like people were collapsing in the streets, you know, there was obviously that immediate kind of, a lot of, well, fear was pushed very early on, wasn't it? That, you know, this was, this was something else, you know, people just falling on the floor and the Chinese having to lock people in houses and melt the doors. And, you know, it was really sold to us like a horror movie. Mm. Um, so there was that first thing where my wife got quite panicked and, you know, we did, we did buy some extra stuff, you know, bought some things in case. We had a friend yeah. that knew people in government um, who had told her that there was going to be um, potentially army on the streets and a lockdown. So we knew a little bit ahead of time. And, and obviously we told people that, you know, there's going to be a lockdown. They're like, no, you know, don't be so ridiculous. You know, that won't happen. Uh, there won't be any army coming out on the streets. So, you know, that's mad. You know, a few days later, of course, they announced there's going to be a lockdown and that potentially they might have to use the army to assist, you know. <laughs> um, and then, of course, after that, not long after that, it was that the schools, we, we sort of heard the schools might close. You know, you'd say that to people and they'd be like, no, no, the schools are never closed. You know, so it, it's been a, we've been generally been ahead of the curve. But I think from April, I started saying to people, I made a video sort of warning people that, you know, there was the potential for this to turn into a two-tier system with passports for those that you know get a vaccine or have immunity you know if they catch it and they get um, natural immunity or if there's a vaccine later that so we could end up with a, a sort of black mirror-esque type scenario with a two-tier society with these you know that the haves and the have-nots but we, you know where you have a have a past to live and others don't and that's funny because of course now here we are you know all these months later and that's that's precisely the scenario that we're going into so I mean yeah I was quite skeptical I did an interview with 
if you know the Grimerica podcast over in Canada, we did it in April, early April, um, where I was raising quite a lot of my um, you know doubts really about the narrative that we were getting sold, you know, and in terms of the the infection fatality rates, um, the numbers involved, you know, a lot of these the statistics that were being used, you know, I was very skeptical of. So yeah, I suppose I was ahead of the curve in that respect. Yeah. Um, what's um, if you were to do? What would you say about yourself? Uh, the ba- you know, the elevator pitch. What's your background, and what what do sure. you do? What's what? Mm-hmm. Um, just to give me a little bit of sense well, of that. Well, I studied information business information technologies at university, and I, I have worked in sort of banking and in real estate and stuff professionally. But um, really, I suppose that my passions are in writing but particularly in fringe topics, you know, so anything a little bit off kilter, I, I'm very interested in uh, anomalous research in science. So, you know, everything to the psi, the, the paranormal, um, but also ancient history, mysteries in history. So the, the less conventional um, parts of our story and prehistory, the human origins narrative. Uh, but as well as that, I mean, I think because I'm, I'm at an Asperger's person. So I always think that's, really is kind of key to how I am as a person, the way I focus on things is that I do have what we call a non-typical neurological profile uh, and often see things from a a different perspective to other people and have this focus, a kind of singular focus where I could spend, uh, you know, long periods, many, many hours, hundreds of hours, you know, really on a singular topic going through, you know, papers and studies and stuff, which I guess for most people is difficult, but for Asperger's people is actually what we do, you know, is part of the profile of being kind of singular focused on something we find interesting. So I, I've worked my way through almost all areas of fringe and controversial science. Uh, and now I don't know if I, I suppose I'd like to think myself as a multidisciplinary independent scientific researcher, um, but also I suppose someone who's experienced a lot of strange stuff himself. So I, I'm not just looking into it it's also you know studies driven by personal experiences uh, you know my own travels and studies and experiences so it's a bit of a blend of being you know scholarly type with somebody who's had you know um, adventures around the world you know, exploring jungles and mountaintop ruins and you know all sorts of other things i've done so i don't know what the the, the shortest pitch would be but that gives some people an idea roughly of kind of my wide range of interests but also the sort of singular focus that allows me to get the information i need yeah yeah the, the singular focus thing i can get mm-hmm. i can <laughs> i can get to a certain extent the absolute lost and immersiveness in mm-hmm. something to the perhaps the detriment of all others it's yes. just absolutely isn't this why aren't you interested in this because this is the most interesting thing ever and people yes. going oh You've only got five minutes. You're not allowed to talk anymore, Bruce, about that particular subject. <laughs> it's kind of the time it was on in my house, especially with COVID at the late. And she goes, "Okay, yes. that's it now. That's it. You, you okay now? Uh, go. <laughs> I need to talk to somebody else." I sometimes warn people. I say, you know, they they say to me, "Oh, well, that's interesting. You know, that topic." And I say, "Well, look, if you if you ask me anything on it, there's a good chance I'll still be talking to you about it in a couple of hours. So you might not want to actually." <laughs> talk about it you know <laughs> yeah um i and so here we are at this the kind of uh, like when you were referring to this um passport it's not necessarily the haves and have nots though to me it's going to be um those who just go asher look at i'm going to take this and then a minor i think it will be a minority by the time this thing seems like the way it's evolving it'll be a a minority who's going to go, no, I'm not going to take that. I don't need to take it, so why should I take it? Give me a reason why I should take it. And then the whole thing is, unless, you know, you can see the marketing messages, like unless everyone Mm -hmm. is safe, no one is safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, um, has to remind people surely of of the kind of, Brave New World. I mean, I don't know if you saw this, this series of Brave New World, which funnily enough has come out during this, you know, pandemic, which to be honest, it, you know, you, you have to wonder at the timing sometimes of some of these shows. But, you know, in that it does talk about this idea of the social body. You know, that's very focal, actually, in the story is the, is the social body. 
you know, that it's no longer about individuals in this sort of new um, sort of utopian, dystopian future where you don't have individual thinking and individual actions and, you know, it's all about the, the community. And that is very much what we've been sold on. You know, that we don't wear the masks for ourselves, we wear them for others. We don't take this vaccine for ourselves, we do it for others. You know, all of this stuff is being sold on this collectivism that, you know, yes, yes, so what? You know, it doesn't do anything for you, but yeah, it's, it's going to help society. You know, so we have to really find that a little bit, you know, concerning in a way that that is part of a narrative that takes you into this kind of collectivism where, you know, nothing's about you anymore. It's all for the greater good, you know, and all this mm. kind of idea. Um, and that shouldn't be the whole story of a society. You know, it's supposed to be a blend of, yes, some sort of concern for your society, but also living as an individual. I don't think we should lose that part of that. Yeah, I mean, the I've had a conversation with somebody recently and um, who is in, um, in the health uh, world, uh, works for the government in health, and um, they're... Uh, first discussion was what there were you know they were saying basically that all of this is to what we're doing is to was to flatten the curve and protect the vulnerable right that was the opening and that's mm -hmm. i feel what we've done is the words i feel we've protected the the vulnerable mm -hmm. and the second uh, part of the discussion ended up being around this vaccine then um mm -hmm. i was saying well, why do you um the kids need to take this vaccine then and mm -hmm. uh they go well you're protect they're still protecting you know like you've just said there they're protecting the vulnerable but if it's 95 percent successful and then the argument was i don't know how they're so embedded into the argument though well it's the five percent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the risk. But I mean, mm -hmm. the argument just goes totally out the window. If you flatten the curve, if the hospitals can look after it, why do you need, to, why do kids need to take it? Uh, it's yeah. just the contradictions. Mm -hmm. I can't, and, the, and I actually can't even get into a conversation then because they do absolutely don't want to have a conversation on it. Mm -hmm. You know? No, they, they don't. Most people don't want to. They just want this to flow along, that the government's handling it. You know, it's all going to get tidied up in a few weeks. Don't be a you no. Know, don't be a spanner in the works for us by complicating this. You know, it, it's a nice, simple story where you know there was a problem. The government's solving it. A couple of weeks, you know, we'll have a vaccine. We'll all take it, and we'll get back to normal. You know, please don't spoil that story by putting facts into it. You know, uh, and and that seems to be kind of embedded in a lot of people's minds, which is, you know, obviously it's, it's very strange. I mean, you can understand it in some ways, but of course it's very strange to not have any level of wanting to actually understand what's happening or you know having a critical thinking over this when we know that politicians lie all the time routinely you know that's you know it's always it's a joke isn't it you know people like lying politicians but yet suddenly we're asked to just swallow the whole story that we've been given without critical thinking simply because it's one that seems to end with you know a happy ending um and it, it is bizarre because all the way through people have been aware that we've been lied to you know it's it's not hidden. I mean, we've, we've had all these kind of scandals over money being given to, you know, sort of cr cronyism type process, money going to friends of ministers and, you know, failures to get the PPE that they should have had. And, you know, all sorts of mini scandals within the bigger scandal as well. So that there's no reason to believe this story, you know, wholesale. So it, it's definitely a psychological issue we're dealing with. I think it is this idea of authority and it's, it's to be basic about it, it's um, in a way still not letting it go of mommy and daddy and not being mm -hmm. able to think, to assume that the government have your best or hope even. I think it's also that people, uh, rightly or wrongly, don't want to go to the place that the government, they want to be hopeful and imagine that, um, that a government really has your best interests at heart. Yes, absolutely. Because if you if you think about this, and I point this out to a number of people, that you've almost got kind of just two positions. I know that's a little bit simplistic, but there's there's either the government is essentially your friend. You know, you've paid them to do a job. You look after you look after society, and that they're more or less doing that. And so in that scenario, 
the government is going to fix the, do its best to save the economy, to fix this health issue. You know, why would they want to collapse the economy? Why would they want to hurt anyone? You know, those, those ideas that come up a lot. So you either accept all that, but of course that they're going to help us and everyone else be quiet. Or you have to take the other position. There's clear evidence your government is attacking you, right? Um, now that, that's a really a big shift. You know, that's a 180. And I think that people are kind of very much struggling with that because not only does it seem for the average person a very radical position, but also you then have to deal with the horror of having to then <laughs> react to that scenario where, you know, suddenly you're called upon to do extraordinary levels of effort, you know, to stop what the government is doing. And so then you have two motivations for this to not to be true. You know, one of it just the unpleasantness and secondly, the fact that they will have to engage and then actually deal with this. And I just think that the human mind doesn't really want to go there. It doesn't want to go from that comfortable position of the government's got my best interest and it's going to save me to, oh my God, you know, the government is essentially destroying my life and there's no real end in sight to what they're doing, you know. And if, you, if your moment, like say, even if you, if, you, if you don't even go to the place of the government are trying to harm, okay, and if you, or even if you park the idea of a government and just take human beings um, who are trying, mm -hmm. apparently trying to do a job, and let's, let's just imagine that these people are, might be quite good at talking and presenting a case, but they've zero innovation, really lack genuine intelligence and creativity. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. You could say they're very good at talking to politicians. So mm -hmm. they might be able to see, they might be able to argue well, shut you down well, blah, 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 well, but they won't have innovation or creativity. That's, you know, if you were to give the skill set. Mm -hmm. So then if, then if you group all these people together and you say, okay, back in March, they made, they made this decision to lock down. And if they look at the data, they go, well, the whole thing is quietened down. Now you have scientists shouting, ah, but it's nothing to do with lockdown. You have 40 research papers shown about the limited impact and the harm of lockdown. Let's just mm -hmm. park those though mm -hmm. and look at what everybody else is doing because probably there is a sheep element to a certain type of human being who wants sure. to be, they're not really leaders. They just like to be seen loads, that egotistical sort of carry on. So mm -hmm. then you group them all together and you go, well, this has worked. And the safest bet moving forward, even though now, if the, even, the safest bet because everybody else is doing it and let's just forget about Sweden and Belarus and maybe Iceland who's taken a slightly different approach, park all those and let's just follow the crowd. And you know, there's strength in numbers. The argument is everybody's doing it, we mm. should do it. Let's, let's not go to the sinister mm -hmm. yet but let's go to stupidity and ease and sheepness and go, well, everybody's doing it. Seems like it's worked. Let's continue to do it. Well, we have that. But then the funny thing is, of course, if we look around the world, you know, it's, it's not so much that everyone's doing the same thing. We have a strange phenomenon where really Europe, you know, and the five eyes kind of nations, you know, are more or less doing the same kinds of, you know, policies. You know, we have these lockdowns being used. We have the distancing and the masks and, you know, and quite an intense focus on getting everyone to go along. Whereas, you know, if we look, you know, to Africa and some parts of Asia and South America where, where it hasn't been like that. I mean, there are countries, you know, spread out between those conflicts where it has been. But there's, there's many where it hasn't been. And yet, you know, they haven't fared particularly badly. Now, if you look at Africa, I mean, it's a vast continent. You've got over 1.2 billion people in Africa. And the last time I looked, they had 40,000 people that had supposedly died of COVID. Now, you put that into the context of this is not a continent that has an equal level of health care to Europe, you know, by, by any stretch. And yet it has this vast population. Uh, some of those nations are essentially failed states, let's be honest. I mean, how much infrastructure do they have for healthcare during a pandemic? I mean, it's, it's kind of absurd to imagine they're doing a good job, right? And yet we end up with something like 40,000 people dying there and they're not doing all these measures. They're not really doing the strict lockdowns and enforcing any health measures. So how can that be? How can that be that, that in these nations where they're not doing it, they're not really faring badly. So, so that should be a glaring point for people as well, that it, it's not quite everyone following along. It seems that 
Europe, North America, Canada, etc., Australia are doing this policy. And it doesn't seem to have done very well if you contrast the fact that Europe has lost, apparently, it's, you know, it's claimed, we have lost far more people than the entire continent of Africa, where there are millions of people starving and, you know, and, and appalling healthcare systems in many nations. How, how do people add that one up? I mean, you go down to, there was another example, you go to um, Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh initially was trying to do the lockdowns and the masks and so, but their government couldn't really afford to, to do this properly. They couldn't really afford to pay people to be furloughed. And, and in the end, most of the people thought, well, we have to go back to work. You know, it's a fairly poor country. It's the densest populated country in the world with an enormous population very small area. So you would think that a virus would rip through Bangladesh, right? That it would, you know, we'd be seeing astonishing numbers of death across that country because of combination of poverty, a lot of people packed into a smaller area than us. Well, you know, per, per, per hundred thousand people, less land. Um, that yet, what happened was not that at all. I mean, the last I saw they had put, a, I think it was, um, well, it was a few thousand, you know, it wasn't even to the 10,000. They'd had a few thousand people, I think 5,000, people that were supposedly had died of this and the people have begun to laugh at those who are wearing masks because they're like well this isn't really happening there's not really a problem and they said it had switched around to being pointing and laughing at people that are wearing masks right so how how is that functioning how can it be that bangladesh manages to completely see off this deadly pandemic while people aren't even following these rules and that they end up with far less deaths than the uk with our you know advanced, supposedly advanced first world healthcare systems and all these rules. Now, what is happening here? This, this doesn't add up. I, and I think it comes back to um, sort of a confirmation bias, which we should equally check ourselves for. Um, uh, but, it, you know, it is, it is, that's what they're doing is this, mm -hmm. they're not really interested in that. They, no. There's the grouping together of, we'll say this, I mean, there's no mention of Russia. I don't know how Russia's doing. Maybe it's a disaster over there. Um, but uh, there's these, it's Canada, the US and Europe mm -hmm. and uh, and Australia coming together. And, yeah. and it is that, is it if you're a politician, you're not going to take the risky strategy? I mean, we can get into the sinister, sure. but if you were to look at it, why would we take the risky strategy here? Mm -hmm. It's let's just lock it down mm -hmm. because that appears like it's safer. And this is, you know, let's call it, it is a virus. It did do damage back in March, mm -hmm. April. Mm -hmm. It does seem like it's, it's uh, falling dramatically in terms of the deaths uh, and the, you know, the hospitalizations, the case numbers are the case numbers. But I mean, if we had the case numbers that were accurate back in March, it, it probably would show the same, Mm -hmm. um, tale or the same um, situation but trying to understand it then is it is it that that sheep but so who are you led by then though who why is it better to talk to a branded uh, pharmaceutical company than independent scientists mm -hmm. who, why is it better to talk to a, a corporate as opposed mm -hmm. to the and, and ignore the 12,000 scientists that signed the Great Barrington Declaration. Why, why, why is it better? That's the part where I kind of go, even just say this conversation that we're having, this conversation, I don't hear it. It's just a kind of a conversation trying to get to the bottom, of, even though we sort of both know, really, we're not saying the thing that we both probably feel about this whole thing. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, the sage, the sage issue we had, of course, in England, you know, this thing where they... Uh, totally we have a government that is totally reliant on a small you know grouping of advisors uh, not all of whom are scientists you know we have social scientists we have some you know economists and business people in there um, but we have this very strange focus on sage um, which, which is particularly bizarre as, as now it's become clear that there was no real focus on having an epidemiologist in there I think they had like one virologist um, there, there was all these modelers, you know, people that focus on doing computer models. There were behavioral scientists and psychologists and, and people connected with obviously the, the, you know, the pharmaceutical industry. And, you know, you're sitting there thinking, where are the people that you'd want on this? And, and it was highlighted in a Guardian article that, you know, why didn't we have people that were from the front lines of, 
you know, medical health? And why, why wasn't the main team that deals with coronaviruses in the UK, why weren't they contacted? They sort of said, we kept thinking we'd get a call, you know, that someone would say, hey, you know, you guys deal with coronaviruses. We need you on the team. And they said, we never heard anything from the government. Uh, and when you start hearing that kind of side of it, you can't help but scratch your head if you, you know for the average person anyone hearing that scratching your head and thinking well what went wrong there because you know if you're the prime minister and you have access to essentially anyone you know you can pick up the phone right we're calling you know oxford uni or whatever we want your best on this you know get us the get us your top people on you know viruses um and to end up with all these data modelers and psychologists and behavioral manipulators and you know, it, it just does not sound like you're putting together the A-team here, you know, that's going to deal with a pandemic. It's straight to this understanding of how you're going to get people to do essentially what you want them to do. And, and then we've seen this amazing amount of spend on marketing campaigns and PR and jingoism, simple to remember messages that have been repeated again and again and again, which again play into that sheep-like following that it's that a simple solution you know hands face space hands face space hands face space you know um that are just programmed into people and you know stay home save the nhs you know, very simple messages that don't really come with any level of detail of, of the why or you know where this is going or it, it, it's you make it so simple for people so i suppose it does encourage that sheep-like view because you don't have the information to be critical you're just being told look it's simple get on with it you know I, I, and even, I mean, and what I'm talking about then is is the politicians being sheep with each other. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, people are getting this information. This is their source of news. They don't want, they just want to go from A to B. They don't want hassle. They don't want to double mm -hmm. look at this. And they, they want to take the news headlines as, mm -hmm. okay, because they have enough shit in their lives. They have enough things going on. They have to pay the bills. They have to go from A to B. They don't mm -hmm. want to mm. have to double click on things. And what I'm talking about is this, yeah. gov the governments then one following yeah. another. Now, in right. my mind, uh, governance, go true governance would be, here's what we've learned. This is probably, you know, the honesty of it, this is not going to leave us. Viruses are part of life. Yeah. Now, the reality is this one has been in, this one has been in the country for 12, you know, it's just truth. And truth would sound a little bit, we, we're never going to lock down the country again because it's the worst solution. What we're going to do is transform healthcare. Like, let's just imagine what proper innovation would do. We're going to transform the healthcare for now, forever. That, that we will always have beds for something like this, but we will never lock down a country again. We've learned what we've learned. And it really didn't do us any good because all of the information suggests that it actually didn't help. No. But there isn't that, dis and there, because that would take, uh, if one government head did that, that would risk the, the vast amount of people, people who have bought into this now, mm -hmm. who are living their lives in fear, saying that's irresponsible. You're yeah. a disgrace to open up a country again. But mm -hmm. so it would need to be comprehensive. It needs to be, look, telling the truth, ha a vast majority amount of the people who died were in care homes and hospices. We didn't do a good enough job protecting them. They're not going to say that because of the responsibility of that. They're never going to, so it's all kind of feeding into itself, almost, mm -hmm. that lockdown and control. And then even for healthcare workers, mm -hmm. they can buy into the narrative of, oh, you need to lock down now because we can't, we can't manage this. But mm -hmm. they have been not managing forever. Yeah. Yeah. They've been fucking up. Yeah. forever yeah. that's been the way it's been but mm -hmm. suddenly now they have an excuse they have a way out of even beginning to try and manage it do you know what i mean it's well absolutely and we we know in the you know across the uk particularly that the nhs had been savaged for years that the conservatives you know had wanted to break it up and privatize and you know and, and cut costs and all the rest so i mean we've ended up with a lot less beds anyway because all these local hospitals have been turned into well either closed or turned into glorified doctor's surgeries you know where there's really not much you can get done at the local hospital so i mean the, the actual health service itself had been savaged over years so every year around you know flu season there's this complaint that they're overwhelmed you know and they don't have enough beds and stuff because they just don't have enough beds you know it's because if you compare um 
our situation to Norway or to Germany, you know, they, they have a lot more ICU beds per 100,000 people and a lot more regular beds in hospitals. So, of course, when we hear the story, the NHS might get overwhelmed. That's less about the number of people getting sick than it is about the number of beds that we normally have. And there's, there's those little factoids that um, give context to things. That, so, yes, I mean, an MP would have those concerns saying, well, the, you know, we're getting told that the NHS is struggling. But it's like, well, yes, that is true. But then why is it struggling? You know, how was it doing last year? You know, we find out last year it got to 95% or something capacity. So, yes, it's, it, it is struggling. But these are bigger issues, you know, that we could have put in the bed capacity over the last nine months, right? So then these, these are, so they're part truths. Yes, it's truth that it can be struggling. So you can see from an MP's point of view, there again, this report says, look, they're really busy, you know, maybe we'll have to lock down. So you can see how it's sold to them. Mm -hmm. And again, as you say, that they have this concern that, well, we've gone this far with it. You know, our names are all on this, this idea of lockdowns and suppression methods that, yeah, do you turn around and say, well, we think actually they're a disaster. You know, we've all supported them. We've rolled them out. Um, now we're going to tell you that we've destroyed everything without any particular gain. You know, they'll, they'll be happen. out forever. They'll never yeah. be voted in again. Yeah. So, that honesty, would, I mean, and that honesty would be amazing, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? We yeah. thought it was, but we'd never dealt with anything like this in our lives. Mm -hmm. We tried the, the, our only solution, but we're not going to fight this now. I, what we're going to do, but like even the idea of, saying to because it's all fear 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 and it's it's, yeah. it's total distrust of government and government totally distrusting people because if it wasn't the distrust wasn't there it would be as simple as saying bruce mm -hmm. uh you're going to be fine 99 percent. if you're going to get it you'll be sick for a few weeks it'll be a bad flu you'll feel horrible you might have some effects for a few weeks afterwards but it will leave you you will be fine now don't go hanging around granny for a while, mm -hmm. or if you are, be extraordinarily cautious. Be aware that even wearing a mask will do no good around her, that if you have and you don't know you have. So be hypersensitive around her and get, you know, do something there to be careful. But the chances are if she's healthy, or you know, your nan yeah. will recover yeah. also. But if she has underlying conditions, if she's diabetes or whatever, an education so, would say, so just be careful. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, washing hands actually will probably do a better job uh, than, uh, or whatever. But yeah. real clarity, as opposed to, you know, the people are idiots, so we need to make them all afraid. And yeah. then the government are idiots because they're, they, you know, they haven't a clue what they're doing. And it's this distrust that is just everywhere. And, and it's all this fear. And mm -hmm. fear, fear, fear. No, there's no, nothing... I've seen a few politicians with a bit of courage, and obviously mm -hmm. there's there's the few a good few scientists out there and uh, doctors, but they're all getting destroyed for kind of mm -hmm. going. Uh, can we not just even have a conversation mm -hmm. about this? No, that was the first casualty of the pandemic was the um, polite conversation that people should be having around it. Yeah. You know, it turned aggressive very fast. That. You know that anyone that was questioning the the narrative was uh, essentially shot down. You know, mm -hmm. even leading scientists. You know, people from Stan, you know, Stanford and Oxford and stuff that were questioning it. You know, and in normal circumstances, would we be seeing you know Stanford professors and Oxford professors being called sort of conspiracy theorists and and wild mavericks and stuff? You know, it, it's a very odd situation to see the the media turn so quickly on people that would normally be seen as respected voices within academia, you know, just because they weren't supporting this core narrative. Um, and the measures we had as well, we have to remember, we essentially copied them from China, you know, from the CCP. I mean, that's not usually our go-to place for ways to deal with problems, you know, which is, is, is quite extraordinary in itself. And people should question that because, I mean, lockdown really came from that Chinese model where they, they were using extraordinarily you know, extreme draconian measures that we were, well, certainly that's what we were shown this, you know, yeah. closing off roads. And, you know, when do we go to China, you know, to get our ideas for how we deal with problems, a place that's known as having, you know, the greatest human rights violations perhaps in the world. And, you know, so th there was something very wrong then, you know, because yes, they normally do have, you know, these AI camera systems and tracking people and, you know, 
some passes to do what you're allowed to do. And so it's a very strange. And it wasn't like that was what was coming out of a country that we would normally look to for a health model, right? So how did we accept that so quickly? And I think I saw some recently, I saw a video, and suddenly, and it was talking about, you know, that we're going to have these passes like in China. And they said, like in China, when did we get to being like China? And, yeah. and, and I think that's really something we've just skipped over as though that's okay to take the model of the, one of those dystopian societies on the planet. I, I totally remember them. People have been dragged out of their apartments and, mm -hmm. you know, them arriving in the white gas tight or airtight suits and dragged out. And everybody kind of looked at, well, I remember looking at that going, I wouldn't be surprised if those people are never seen again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, yeah. And, and, and almost kind of going, well, that's China. I mean, I don't really know what's going on there, but their regard for human life, you would have thought, is not as high as ours. But that, I don't know that now. That's, but that's the impression that you get from, again, certain type of media influence, really. That sure. They're, they're, so, you, you know, you don't, I don't know for definite. Maybe they love their people and all the people live unbelievably well. <laughs> but I, I was Possibly. going to talk... Possibly, yeah. I was going to talk to you just there when you were saying about the, the speech and polite conversation. I, I almost think that this, the, the divisiveness has come from this world of Brexit and people feeling fooled by uh, an alternative perspective, let's just say, or the Trump discussion of left and right. Like it's, it's kind of now about having an opinion here, being right and being wrong now. Mm. And, and not about, oh, well, what's the best scenario? This, this isn't political, this is about mm. health. Mm -hmm. and, but in a way it ties into that conservative and freedom and mm. liberal and, you know, and controlled. And yet it seems that the divide here, what I've kind of noticed is that people who I probably would have disagreed with on the... On another side, I, I would say I'm on neither side, but say, for example, if um, on uh, something like abortion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people who would have been uh, absolutely anti-abortion are now over on this side, mm -hmm. but then people who are extreme liberals mm -hmm. are over on the, and, but it seems to be that the divide is kind of collapsing even, and people are swapping yeah. over sides yes. because it is apparent there isn't sides. It's just mm -hmm. about this idea of, but you know what I mean? And I think it's all like a kind of a, a house or, you know, a, how do you say, a perfect storm now, where in the time where we absolutely the most need to be having a reasonable conversation, it's collapsed because of all the shit that's gone beforehand mm -hmm. with a Brexit mm -hmm. or a, a Trump discussion or all of these smaller arguments to people now go for the 12,000 scientists that have, Assigned the Great Barrington Declaration, they go, no, 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 I heard that's funded by such and such. I won't even look at it. Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, and it's funny, you know, because I mean, I'm working with a local group of people here in Stroud in Gloucestershire with anti lockdown stuff, right? And, you know, amongst the people that have got involved, you know, you've got uh, members of, you know, Labour Party, Conservatives, um, Brexit Party, some Greens, um, people that have been connected with the Extinction Rebellion other people from the local um, Steiner community. I mean, and we're sitting there in a room and you're thinking you'd never get these people in a room normally. Yeah. You know, you'd never get them in a room normally. And to all be on this, this sort of the same page is in itself is extraordinary that those divisions have gone. But then at the same time, as you say, there's this even greater chasm has opened up now between those people that support these lockdowns and these measures and those that don't. So even though we've managed to bridge these other differences, this, this new far greater division has opened up. And, and it's extraordinary in terms of how it's brought people together in that way, but then of course, how it's moved them so far apart. And as you're saying, it's swapped people across onto different sides who normally would be allies, you know, even relationships, of course, you know, we're hearing about people getting divorced over this because they just can't bear their partner keep telling them, say, you know, we've got to keep going with these lockdowns when they're, they're screaming, we need to get out of these lockdowns. So mm. it's been that divisive, really. Yeah, it's, it is kind of phenomenal in a way. I, I think, though, uh, I do think that it's kind of that seed of, it, say the person that you're in that room you, and people you might have got on with in the past, 
the reality is if this was all to end, you could go right back to fighting again because then you have the right to fight. You have the right to disagree. You have the right to kind of shout. And it's, is it Voltaire that says, I, I don't agree with you, but I'll fight to the death for your right to mm-hmm. say what you want to say. And mm-hmm. I, I think that seed is in there, that in you or not in you. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. like you're actually defend. You're not defending one or another in a way. You can see both sides. It's more, it's the freedom that if you want to stay inside, mm-hmm. stay inside. You want to wear the mask, wear the mask. You don't need somebody else to wear the mask then. Why yeah. do you need? It's like, I don't need you to agree with my opinion. It's only an yeah. opinion. I don't give a shit. And you don't need to, me to agree because I think that seed is there. And, you know, that kind of seed of, mm. mm-hmm. I really liked, um, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a, there's a meme which has somebody saying, you know, remember, I wear the mask for you. And the other person says, please don't bring me into your psychosis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, people should be able to do what they want. I do think, yeah, you know, you don't have to expect someone else to agree or then have to participate but everyone should have the right to do what they want. You know, yeah. and I think if people want to go riding around their bicycle with a mask on or with a chicken suit on or, or whatever they want, that's, that's not really my business, you know, because they're not doing any harm to me. So yeah, I, I would absolutely support their right to do that. Um, but yeah, there shouldn't be this other side of it where they're saying that we must all comply, like some sort of Borg has invaded our society, you know, and that we must all be assimilated into this collective. It's like, well, no, thank you. I'm really not interested in living in that kind of um, collectivist society, you know, sort of communist, slightly communist in some ways, but I don't think we're heading into communism by any stretch, you know, because a lot of this is corporate interest. But, um, you know, it, it's kind of using part of that kind of narrative. Um, yeah, I, I really feel strongly that there should be that conversation around personal responsibility, personal rights, um, and that that should be something everybody should kind of have an agreement on that you know this should be like with Sweden where they asked people that you know could you please do this you mm-hmm. know and, and if people wanted to do it they could right and if they didn't want to they didn't have to now that's called being an adult isn't it and having an adult relationship with your government whereas what we've had as you pointed to earlier is a kind of parental situation where you know mum and dad government have said you're all very naughty go to your rooms stay there until we've sorted this out kind of thing, you know, you know, and that you'll have to do this and you'll have to do that and you're in a lot of trouble now. You're going to, all your rights are going. And uh, if we see you out walking, the drone will be watching you. And, you know, it just went to that very quickly that there wasn't an adult conversation. It was, you know, you're in trouble and this is what you need to do. Um, and that, yeah. why people accepted that so quickly it, it is peculiar. And I think many of us were, you know, upset by how quickly people acquiesced onto a lot of these ideas. I think it though, I mean, I think it's kind of like, um, well, I'm just doing my job. I'm looking after my kids or I'm doing whatever. Can I, and I trust that they will do their job. The problem is the trusting that they will do their job exceptionally well, as exceptionally well as you will do yours at home, the way you do the best you can, looking after your own, your own empire, your own world. You do the best you can to look after that. The problem is, it, there's that sense that well, should they do a good job too? And they, but that's not. It seems to be, not not. I mean, and the track record would suggest that it's never the case, ever, ever, no. ever the case. No. no, I mean, what was particularly clear, and this is something I'll ask people to sort of cast their minds back to in terms of doing a good job. I mean, right at the very beginning of this, we saw um, this decision. I don't, not just in the UK, but I, I think in many European nations. The decision to send people back into care homes who were sick, you know, and that, that this essentially sparked off the big wave of deaths that we saw. Now, we know in the UK, I think it's come to about 25,000 people died in the care homes. And, and most of those were associated with the government policy, right, where they said, OK, we're going to empty out the hospitals as much as we can in case we get this big wave of people getting sick from this new virus. So they send thousands and thousands of people back to the care homes who were already ill and many of whom apparently, you know, were infected with this SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then we had all these people dying in the care homes. So 25,000. Now, when you think about it, that chart at the beginning showing the sudden death rate, like, oh my God, you know, everyone's dying. We now would look at that again very differently and think, well, yes, 
that's all those people in the care homes dying that they send back to die, right? That didn't so that even was, get into hospital. They weren't brought no, back no, into hospital. They, they, no, because they were in hospital and they were sent back. And then the ones in the care homes who got infected with them, of course, didn't go to hospital. So they died in the care homes. And even amongst the deaths in the hospitals, a lot of those were care home residents that were still in the hospitals. So when you look at that first peak, 20 odd thousand of those deaths are those care home people. So without the government policies, how many people would have died in, in March and April, right? So really you're looking at manslaughter, a kind of government manslaughter from the policy that they put in place. And they put do not resuscitate on all of these people. So now, now let's imagine that was done differently. That policy didn't exist. Those people were treated in hospital normally without being sent back, you know, half dead uh, and infected and that they had their normal treatments and they went home only when they were well, right? Let's just imagine that. I think we wouldn't be talking about any of this because there wouldn't have been this huge spike in deaths. Now, we also understand that going forward, there's been something like 30,000 deaths associated with the lockdown. About 30,000 deaths, extraordinary levels of death. People that had their care disrupted, were not screened for diseases, you know, didn't have treatments. Now, if you put these figures together, you're already at sort of 55,000 people that are dead from government manslaughter, right? So absolutely, at the, at the very least, inept, beyond belief, right? You've caused 35, you know, 35,000 deaths, well, 30,000 deaths at home, 25,000 of the care homes. That's nearly all of the deaths that are being associated with, with COVID. You know, we've got something like, depending on who you, who you are, something like 60 to 70,000 maybe now, right? So, but the vast bulk are coming out of these government policies. So I just don't see how any of this would be happening if not for at the least a government's failure to do the right thing, because that, that curve would have been very, there wouldn't have been a curve to flatten really. You know, there would have been a gentle kind of slope, you know, and, and then a gently coming back down if we hadn't really kind of almost said, well, with, with these people are expendable, send them back to die. Now, if you think about that, that's kind of extraordinary because then, well, would we be having any of this situation without these government policies? You know, we would have a fairly typical year for deaths. They, they, I just don't see there would be anything extraordinary happening um, because the deaths beyond the care community have not been that, you know, not, not that steeper curve. We've just seen that there's been, you know, people that have got other conditions in hospitals so some of the diabetics and people with heart disease and stuff so of course there are younger people that have these conditions those people of course have been very badly affected and some of those people have died and we know 95 percent of all the deaths have been those with underlying conditions but we certainly wouldn't be dealing with 50,000 60,000 if not for these government policies and I think people need to if you're going to deal with the you know the do masks work and vaccines? I think that's, it's wrong. You know, that's dealing with the river when it reaches the sea, right? We need to look at the spring, that where this started from, because it's really questionable that we, we actually had the level of problems we're getting sold on. Because you see this in Sweden and you can see this in Spain and Italy and elsewhere, that the, the main deaths back at the beginning were in care home settings. So it wasn't just us. This is same in Ireland, US. same in Ireland, yeah. Same in Ireland, same in New York. It was nearly all care home deaths. So what are we really dealing with? It seems more like we're dealing with something criminal that has happened in the care industry that has spilled over into our all of our lives because it really shouldn't be that we're talking about this as though it was the natural spread of an epidemic because care homes are anything but a natural environment. I mean, these are places that already exist outside of society, really. You know, that if anywhere could be insulated and isolated from problems, surely it's care homes, which are often, you know, on the edges of towns, you know, big houses on their own that, you know, really could be addressed in a very different way to how we'd address the spread of a virus in a town centre or on the trains or, you know, whatever, right? So it's kind of extraordinary that if we couldn't have isolated them there, you know, where can you isolate people, right? Um, so this is more about an epic failing, at the very least, in policies around the care industry and the fact that what we call care homes often have no care. You know, these are places which are often run very poorly. They're for profit. Um, we know, you know, anyone who's worked in the care industry sort of knows that some of these places are, are, are quite unpleasant. You know, they're not, and then they have the cheapest workers. There's a lot of staff coming in and out temp workers 
um, swapping between facilities. If anyone was infected, they would carry that between facilities. None of this was mysterious to people in that industry, right? So if the government had stepped in and said, you know, we think there's a new virus, obviously older people are going to be, you know, amongst the most likely to get hit with it. Right, let's beef up the care industry. Let's make sure we've got the protections there and the staff, because that's where it's going to be an impact. We know respiratory viruses impact the elderly with underlying conditions. I mean, this is not new. That's not new, right? So I don't see how we're looking at this as extraordinary because it is an issue with the failure in the care industry. And that seems to have been pushed to one side. Not even discussed. Not really discussed. It's the no. exact same thing here. Um, we're the most vulnerable. The most vulnerable haven't been protected. And yet all the, they spent all the time controlling the, or telling healthy people what to do and what they actually should have been doing is mm -hmm. protecting the most vulnerable. That's, well, that's, not, your, that's your job. Like, you know, yeah. if, you're, if, you're, um, if you're against an enemy and mm -hmm. you have a, a, a castle to protect, let's just say, mm -hmm. and you know the door that the enemy is going to get in, are you going to leave that door open mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and protect the rest of the castle when you know for a thousand percent that's where the problem is? Yeah. That's the yeah. vulnerability. Well, you're going to, are you not going to do everything there? Just in simple, that's what mm -hmm. you're going to do. You don't need to mm -hmm. be a wizard to go, well, that's what you just do. Mm -hmm. Look after the and, vulnerable. Well, and in Ireland... And then well, there isn't a problem. Then you have, I, I, I believe the situation in Ireland was as well that something like 90% of the people that died were so unwell that they, they were not even eligible for treatment. Yeah. So these were not people that were doing well before the virus. So, they, you yeah. know, it's... And it's, it is that, what I find extraordinary, and this is the part where I can't, in, in open conversation, we'd say, to try and get, to figure out the right solution. It always seems to be to prove a point of view, mm. as opposed to going, well, what about this or what about this? But mm. Like, it's, it's literally dying for Sweden to fail. And any yes. opportunity, some sort of media, as opposed to going, wasn't it amazing the way Sweden trusted their people? It's yeah. Sweden really screwed up there. Not the, the, the love that I think is quite, you know, amazing that they would mm -hmm. respect their people to be adults. And it's like when our Prime Minister got up there recently, you know, our, there's the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And normally the figures we talk about every single day are mm -hmm. the Republic of Ireland, not the North of Ireland, because yeah. that's part of Britain. And But when he got up to give his speech to the nation, he goes... 3,000 people have died in the island of Ireland. To, and to me, that's okay. Let's make the figure bigger. Let's mm. get that figure. Not 2,000. Get mm. it, let's get it up to 3,000 because it sounds much better. Yeah, yeah. I, and that's what, what I can't understand is, is, is that. I, I can understand yeah. it totally. Yeah. I'm not an, an idiot. But it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the relentless fear. So, mm. she, sorry, Frank, 3,000 people have died. I'm not, I, and I'm not arguing with what mm -hmm. this is but it's like as if the discussion about death suddenly death is a possibility yes death is a conversation to be had. can we talk about death then are we do you really want to talk about death mm -hmm. or is it just this where it's it's the it's it's okay because it's contagious do we want yeah. to talk about famine and disease and mm -hmm. bad mm -hmm. health care and uh, mcdonald's mm -hmm. on every corner or do we just talk about this you know yeah. what I mean? It's yeah. it's all this conversation to make it to make the argument I'm right and you you're wrong and you need to shut your mouth. Yeah, with these daily death counts and stuff. You know, we've we've never had anything like that. This extraordinary focus on a daily death count. You know, and you know, almost as if well, if you can't see the body stacking in your road, we'll give you a simulation of what it would feel like by giving you a daily death count of around the country how many people are dying. You know, so you're, 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 it's, it feels like you're there seeing it yourself almost, yeah. you know, which is just bonkers, absolutely bonkers. There's no reasoning that we need to have that. You know, it's, it's been absolutely relentless. And of course, once the death count began to fall, they switched to cases because the numbers are bigger, you know, that, and again, in any conventional sense, we would be saying, well, it's great news. The death count is down, you know, we're going to carry on with it, but now it's a, you know, five a day or something, you know, throughout the summer, it was very low. You know, yeah. so it just instead though it just switched. It was like, well, it's got too low now. So to make it more 
you know, impactful. We're going to switch to cases now, you know. Yeah. And that was so seamless almost. There was no explanation of why we're going to do this. It just went suddenly on to what was the biggest number we can focus on. Let's go with these cases now. Um, and that should have made people question, of course, just again, you know, what, why do we need to have the most terrible sounding version of the news? You know, why can't there be some good news that, you know, it's kind of fading away and, you know, that, hey, things are better. Not this. Now we need to, you know, absolutely crap our pants because the case numbers are going up with these, you know, with the testing. Um, and, but the, the idea that people are, people don't, not only do they not, uh, the government doesn't trust the people, the people don't really, but they will follow the government, but they don't necessarily trust, but they will follow because I can't be asked. It's basically that mm -hmm. sure I have enough to do. And then people distrust other people because they kind of go, well, we can't let people uh, mm -hmm. look after themselves. That's irresponsible. So then we can't start telling people that um, it's not as bad as it was. Or sorry, not even that. It's not nearly as bad as forecasted and modeled mm -hmm. back in mm -hmm. March. Yeah. It's not nearly as bad as that, everybody. The chances are you recover. Because if they say that, they'll go, oh, people will start being irresponsible. Well, That's but then I Chris Whitty did say that, didn't he? I mean, he did come out on one of the news things here saying that, well, at the end of the day, you know, most people won't get it and that those that do, most won't die. And that even in the most critical cases, the majority survive. You know, you'd think at that point that there would have been a moment, you know, head scratching of mm. what? You know, he's saying what now? Because after we've done all this, you know, but there was almost that, I don't know, that it was just phased out in people's minds, you know, because it, it, it didn't fit the rest of the story and they didn't really react because that should have been the bit where you would say, isn't it? Then what are we doing? You know, what the hell are we doing then, Chris? Mm. You know, because then it just carried on as if that fact didn't matter what he'd said that you know nearly everybody would survive this and not to you know not to think that those in the hospitals would all die or you know it was a very strange because obviously we've been treating it like ebola the guy comes out and says you know it's not that bad and then we just go on treating it like ebola so even even weirder yeah I, and uh why do you think see where my brain goes i kind of go I kind of go down a rabbit hole of, okay, well, this is where this will end up then. This is, not, if we continue down this path, it's, it is, this fear thing is never going to leave. And even if there is vaccine, it'll be the next thing and it'll be lockdown will be a possibility mm -hmm. all the time because healthcare workers will be up in arms going saying, I can't handle it. It's too much. Yeah. We need to lock down. And then this whole movement of, uh, Towards this, um, uh, sorry, I was actually going to make the point that they can't almost educate and give this news to people. They could also say that people could sue the government saying, uh, yeah. you know, you told us that it was okay and look, I I've lost my such and such. The pro what's ironic and crazy about that leads us into the vaccine where I don't think we can sue th um, these vaccine companies if there's a problem with the vaccine. No, they, they've got an indemnity against being responsible for what happens. People will have to try to sue the government. So again, even if there is some money available, that's coming out of the public pocket, like everything else that's happening now. That So if there is injuries, we're going to have to get our own money back from the government, from our tax money, in a time when the government has just spent everything in a wild spending spree. So on top of that, let's say there's a, a load of, you know, large you know, claims for vaccine damage, that, you know, that's millions and millions more that's just coming out of this endless well of printing money over this situation, which I can't even call a pandemic anymore because it doesn't meet the requirements for a pandemic, you know, and, and that's something, people don't like it when I say that, but if you look at the definition of a pandemic, that's not what we're in because we're now in what is a concurrent resurgence of an endemic virus, right, in the, in the in due to seasonal changes. And that actually is not a pandemic. Once you get to that, you're in a post-pandemic stage because a pandemic is flowing out of a singular source spreading across the world. Now that did happen, at least it seemed to happen, you know, earlier in the year, but then it faded away in the summer and now it's resurged, you know, across Europe concurrently. It's not spreading out of anywhere, right? It's become endemic. 
So we're in a post pandemic stage. Uh, and that's, again, that's not something that's really explained. You know, I just, I was looking something up, you know, on the WHO website and they had the kind of definitions and, you know, the, you think, Christ, we're not even in a pandemic then, are we? So, and yet we're being sold all these narratives on it. But when, you know, my, it's kind of mind bending, but yeah, you can see where the, where the direction of the arrow is taking us. As you say, you don't really come out of this fear. You don't come out of any of this because the vaccine, for example, I mean, I'm not sure if anyone, well, I feel that the majority of people are not understanding what is being said by these pharmaceutical companies, for example, that we're told that the vaccines are 90% you know, effective or 95% effective. Okay, effective at what? Right, and, and, and that's in the small print, you know, because one of, the, one of the problems we've had in the way the media has talked is that they have merged the terms coronavirus, COVID-19, and SARS-CoV-2 into a seamless one thing, right? Which they are not, right? We have the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a coronavirus. And then of course you have the disease, COVID-19. Now the vaccine is being sold as it helps prevent COVID-19, right? And it's 90% effective at that. Now that, that, that's not what most people are thinking it is, okay? They're assuming this stops you getting infected and stops you spreading the virus. That is not what it does. There's no evidence at all that these vaccines do that, right? What they're saying they actually do is that they seem to prevent the mild and moderate cases of COVID-19 in those people. And this is in a very small number of people because the other thing that they don't talk much about is how this, this huge data set, I think it was 100,000 people or so that have been involved in these vaccine trials between these two or three initial vaccines and, and only 250 people became infected out of all of them because the, the virus is not really around anymore right it's not much of it around so very few people even got it and then out of those people it was found that these vaccines seem to either prevent or reduce the symptoms but they still got infected right? they still get infected so they can still spread it now does that sound to you what you think the people on the street are thinking this vaccine does because they're being sold the idea that you're protecting the vulnerable. Tell me how you're protecting anyone if you can still catch and spread the virus. Did you see the, there's this um, professor, Luke O'Neill, um, I think Ivor Cummins posted it, but he put it up on um, mm -hmm. about this professor talking to school kids. Uh, yes, yes. Now, this guy, is, he is, um, this guy has been all over our media and he's kind of like, oh, the uh, 33 and a third, uh, you know, uh, not as good as the winks, you're taking out vaccine there now, you'll be grand, uh, kids, you want to go to your uh, end of year dance, don't you? Yeah. Now, it just really bothers me because he is, he's got that lovely sort of charm, you know, back in mm. March, it's, it's perfect for explaining to people he's a great composure all that for for mm -hmm. media perfect for for selling yeah. something but then he's on uh, talking to kids going you might have to wear a yellow bracelet yeah you ah but sure look there'll be arguments about is that okay or not okay but you wear it anyway I, it, it's 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 we wear it how do, as as Ivor said how do we get from back in march you know, we're uh, just trying to protect the vulnerable, flatten mm -hmm. the curve so that mm -hmm. the hospitals can manage, mm -hmm. just so the hospitals can manage to uh, kids wear yellow bracelets. So then what's that? Do, are we excluding kids then who don't have the yellow bracelet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, so it all ties in. It's, it's because it's, it's, it's a mirage. It's because there's lies all surrounding this yeah and then that's the because why would a child need to why then are all the kids allowed to go to school every day in ireland yeah. mm -hmm. if if and then you know if that's protecting not protecting the vulnerable and then they have to but they have to have, wear take a vaccine mm -hmm. i, I just have that, to take a vaccine. Yeah. they have to take a vaccine and what's like you're saying about it who does it actually protect yeah and, yeah. and then he started talking yeah. about vaccine plus restrictions that's right i mean and again we were sold this is that mission creep as the, as the army would call it 
you know, where we were just going to send a few men into Afghanistan or something, and then you end up there 20 years later, you know, and you, you've got half your army there or something, right? This mission creep. And that's what we're seeing in this, because it has gone from, you know, flatten the curve to, as you say, children taking a vaccine that's been rushed through, doesn't do what the public thinks it does, doesn't do what would sensibly need it to do, you know, it, 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 comparing with the narrative to protect the vulnerable, and that the children don't get sick from this virus. You know, they don't die from it. So it's, it's doing nothing for them. It's not doing anything for the people they come in contact with, right? Uh, it can only be a harm to children, right? It can only be a harm. There's no benefit there, right? Because we know that so like 40% of children are immune naturally. And that was been found in a, a couple of studies where they found that because of the, the coronaviruses and stuff that circulate normally in schools, you know, colds, that there is a, a cross immunity. There's antibodies that already will tackle this SARS-CoV-2. And children are the ones who come up having the most of those because of course they're always getting sick, right? They're at school together. They're always getting sick with colds and flu and stuff. So, 40% of them are already immune, probably more, because that's just one type of immunity. There's also um, pre-existing T-cell immunity, and there's genetic differences in populations. Almost nobody in a school probably is vulnerable. But let's say there's a proportion who are. They don't produce the virus. We're not seeing people with COVID-19, that young people getting really sick and going to hospital. That's not happening. So they're not a risk group in any sense. And then they're getting a, uh, a vaccine that does them no good, but could do harm and which doesn't protect the people around them. And they're going to need a permanent bracelet that can't be taken off to say, you know, uh, and maybe an ID card. Now, wh why? Again, anyone should be scratching their head at that point thinking, how does any of that make sense? And then for a virus that we know has faded away to the point where even in the vaccine trials, almost nobody is getting infected, you know, where you sort of want them to get infected. Uh, these people, even they're not really catching it you know 250 out of 100,000 or something having caught it um and that there's no evidence these vaccines prevent deaths you know or even severe cases because we don't know that because there was no deaths or severe cases like hospitalizations in the in the placebo group right so if in the placebo group you've got no deaths or hospitaliz hospitalizations right then you can't say that you prevented any in the vaccine group Okay, so that what is the vaccine for? What is it doing if we haven't proven it actually stops infections or prevents deaths or hospitalizations? You know, and of course it's not tested on the most vulnerable. So we don't know it's safe for those vulnerable, right? So we have this really strange oh, scenario. Wow. Very strange scenario. So it hasn't been tested on the most vulnerable? No, because of course you don't want to risk that. If you're a pharmaceutical company and you start testing on the most vulnerable people, they're the ones who are likely to die, right? Or to have extreme reactions and die, okay? So now we're saying we're going to wheel it straight out to the vulnerable. Now- How perfect, sorry, yeah. Okay, right? how perfect if you're trying to sell loads. If you're yeah. trying to get loads and loads of people vaccinated, mm -hmm. uh, Protect, don't fix the problem. Don't, don't vaccinate for the, for the problem group. Uh, oh. For healthy people, you know, it's tested well on healthy people. And we already know healthy people don't have really an issue with this virus. So if you were to choose a group of even older people, there's been people that are over hundred years old that have been confirmed to have had COVID-19, right? And have survived mm. because they were healthy. So we're not even talking about a virus that affects the elderly. That's again, been missold. Yes. Because, because it was in the care homes. And we've corresponded that that means older people are vulnerable. No! Older people who had a lot of things wrong with them, who in the, the worst setting, in care homes, where they're locked in their rooms most of the time, they don't get much sunlight, they're not getting the vitamin D, which we now know is crucial, right? Um, they are often poorly fed, uh, isolated. Isolation is correlated with problems with these respiratory viruses that we know, and we don't understand it, but we know that people with many good connections in their life and a caring, you know, healthy lifestyle, that these people do better with these respiratory viruses. It's not understood why, but it's understood that it happens. So now you're talking about people that are exceptionally vulnerable with their, you know, lacks of vitamin D, lacks of community, uh, underlying health conditions, and now they've brought up the age range. So it looks like, oh, people over 75 and up are very vulnerable. Well, no, no, no. People over 75 who have 
all kinds of things like diabetes and heart disease. Yes, they're very vulnerable. Probably an, an 80 year old living in their house, uh, going for walks every day and having their friends around is not particularly vulnerable. Now that's not to say they won't get sick, but they probably would go to the doctor, you know, get some medicine or whatever and be okay. You know, just deal with the symptoms. So we've been terribly missold and it, and it shouldn't take the extraordinary lengths that, you know, that I myself and probably others who independently are looking at this have gone to where you have to spend hundreds of hours looking through papers and reading studies and stuff to understand the things the government should be telling people. Right. Mm. Um, so that is in at very least a kind of criminally inept if you don't go to the level of conspiracy, you have to say it's criminally inept that we have a government that has access to all of this information, understands this. There's no way that I can believe that in these SAGE meetings, nobody's saying, well, you know, this vaccine doesn't stop the virus. You know, it's not tested. Should we let people know that it doesn't really do that? You know, and there's no attempt to explain. They keep saying this is 90% effective. It's brilliant. You know, we're going to get back to normal soon. Um, but of course, we'll still need to keep the masks and the distancing. So how that's normal is not quite clear. So that'll be the 70% then. That's how they'll drive to 70%. Not everybody's got vaccinated. So then the people who are not vaccinated will be blamed. Well, yes, because they can still spread the, and this virus will still be, you know, around yeah. um, at, low, at low levels because it doesn't stop it. And so it's because of the people who haven't got vaccinated. That's, oh, be, that's well, we'll always get the blame first. But, but then eventually, you know, they can keep it going, saying, you know, that this virus is still circulating until everyone's had it. You know, yeah, literally yeah. everyone's had it. They'll say it can still circulate because the vaccine... Because I'm sure they will admit, once this is really rolling out, they'll start to say, oh, but of course, we never said it stops it spreading, right? Yeah. Uh, because we've seen these things gradually come out. So once the uptake is, you know, underway, then it'll be, well, well of course, it doesn't protect the vulnerable because it, it can still spread from you right because mm. we get this gradual drip feed because they're taking you somewhere on a journey somewhere right and so you do get the truth out but not when you need it you know it'll start to come out the next thing that this is why it doesn't work you know so we'll need to do something else and it carries on and so you can see the potential for there for this to carry on down that track why we'll need the mask why we'll still need the distancing because it's still spreading from you you haven't stopped it by taking a rushed experimental vaccine. It was nice that you did that, but it's not done what we wanted it to do. So mm -hmm. you're going to have to carry on as you were before in the new normal. And they've been very clear with it is the new normal. So there is not a going back. I mean, if, if you look at the tier system, Scotland's is perhaps the most glaring because it has five stages, you know, five tiers from zero to four. Now, zero, you would assume is baseline reality, right, is normality. But their zero includes that you can't have people from more than three households meeting in your house. So isn't that telling you there's nothing below zero, you're never going back because zero still has draconian measures. So don't kid yourself that this is ever going to something you think of as your old normal because zero is as low as it goes, right? And even in the, you know, in the UK, of course, we have three tiers. They start from medium. They don't start from low. They don't start from nothing. They nothing, start from yeah. low, you know, medium. So yeah. it's being put in our faces the whole time that this is the new normal. There's no going down. There's no going back to how it was. It doesn't matter what happens with the virus. You're going to have restrictions and measures going forward uh, indefinitely, um, eternally, really. I mean, at this point, there's no reason to think that it's not it's meant to be forever, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if anyone kids themselves that it's otherwise, they can look through all of the millions of you know, announcements on coronavirus and all this stuff, and please find me one where it says how we get out of this and how it goes back to how you used to live, because I've not seen one statement from our government or these pharmaceutical companies, or anyone saying, and, and in this scenario, all of the measures go. I mean, have you? I've not seen it, not once. Well, and that's what I'm. Mo I'm kind of. Uh, I suppose let's get a get in. Go further. Let's take a little dip further into the rabbit hole. In the sense of I'm, what I'm curious about is how far, how far, for example, is every individual's um, too far? You know, in terms of being pushed or their freedom being affected. Mine's an inch. Mm. Mine's a fucking inch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Get back. Back up. Back mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now. 
that doesn't seem to be the case for the vast majority of people, no. uh, which is, you know, and if you look at what's happened and the amount of input that's acceptable in people's lives, it's like you say, who you can have in your front, in your back garden, in your house, what to do in your house, where you can go, who you can meet, what happens if you get sick, where you can work. I mean, it's reached into every inch and it's like history shows, you know, that the first steps of sort of authoritarianism or fascism is kind of like, do you mind Bruce just moving all your stuff out of the way there? And you might go, I can't really at the moment. And mm -hmm. I'd say, would you just move your bag? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Just move your bag. And you don't ask, I shall move my bag. Yeah. And then I come back the next time and I say, Bruce, actually, you're in the way there. I can't yeah. see what I need to see. Can you just mm -hmm. get out of my way? Mm -hmm. And you, you try to, but mm -hmm. nobody else has moved, so you're going to move. And that's, it's, it, it seems to be, you know, you bend and then you bend and you bend and you bend and that's your new normal now. The tree yeah. is, is, we've bent the tree to a certain way and it's, you know, somebody, I think yeah. somebody wrote, you know, if, you are, if you're born into slavery, you don't know you're a slave. Now, now we're now we're going into the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. but let's go into the rabbit hole. You know, this the, the yeah. new you've kind of said it. The new norms. What are the new norms? The new mm -hmm. norms are three lots of people in your household. The music a little bit quieter there, like mm -hmm. blah blah blah. And then you know, but this, we're going into what if? But let's go into what if. Yeah, I mean, you you have to sort of look at that and say, well. For the first, first of all, that you know, the government inspiring people to consider that because of the fact that they don't give them a clear way out, you know. And I know that we've we've heard calls for we need to know the exit strategy, right? Well, there is no exit strategy, and at no point has that been something where you know the, the leaders have sat down and said, you know, all of this will go away when we do A, B, and C. I mean, we were initially sold that the idea the vaccine might almost take us back to normal, but, but that's been clarified since, you know, in the last few weeks. They've made that clear. No, no, no. Even the WHO now, um, Ted Ross, made a video saying that, of course, we're going to need to just keep the other things going. So, I mean, they're very clear now that this is just part of an ongoing series of, of, of very draconian controls. Um, so why, you know, why and where is it going? I mean, the, the truth is, from my perspective, that they're also making that clear to people why and where it's going. Because if you look just recently, the independent sage, has now announced that they're going to swap across to the climate crisis, right? Hang on, what the fuck, you know, what's going on there? So these guys that were dealing with the coronavirus crisis are now switching straight across into the climate crisis. You know, isn't that, isn't that a red flag for people that where that's going? And if you look on the, the World Economic Forum's website, and obviously they've had a, a big hand in all of this. We've seen that again and again. And in a strange way, we're told it's a conspiracy theory, but they, they have it on their website that they're doing a reset, right? And that we know that Ted Ross announced the other day, he said he was so happy to see his friend from, his, his friend, I've forgotten the guy's name, from Klaus from the World Economic Forum was on Twitter and he was, you know, bigging him up and all that. So I mean, these guys are all friends from Davos, right? And so we know there's been their hand in this. And so they actually have on their website, you know, if only we could kind of carry on living in these lockdowns, because that would help us meet our CO2 targets for the climate crisis. You know, if only, if only we could keep living in these lockdowns, you know, uh, wonderful, wonderful that they are, that these could save us from the climate crisis. So there's a narrative shift. I mean, if you look at Boris Johnson in the last few weeks, again, it's all been about build back better, green jobs, green power, getting rid of our cars, moving to electric cars. Um, so it's amazing the way they've woven the narrative in that they, we were never scared enough of that climate crisis that they were selling us before. But now that we've been moved into a position of terror, it's, it's almost simplistic to carry it on by just gradually weaving that, that climate story into the pandemic. And there's, there's been efforts over the last few months to do so, saying that, you know, that in some strange way that the two were connected. And I've seen a number of articles saying that. Um, and also putting in the, the race card and saying that, you know, that COVID was racist and so is the climate issue because it's going to affect people of colour more disproportionately. So we've had a strange weaving together of these three big stories, this, you know, the race issues, the climate issues and the coronavirus issues. And, and now they almost are seamlessly turning into one thing that will excuse carrying on with a, a reset of our 
cultures, of our economy, of our human rights, and a, a forming of a kind of a, a new, more global, globalist culture where we're all in this uniform lockstep. And you know, as you're talking about lockstep, mm, I know about that, to yeah. Have a lockstep. yeah, that we are moving in lockstep. You know, we see that the Build Back Better narrative, of course, has been coming out the, the mouths of leaders all around the world. You know, that as we move out of this pandemic, we're all going to build back better. You know, this jingoism and, and these slogans. And if you look at some of the Build Back Better, again, this is, this is a joined up narrative. I mean, there's, there's things in place that have been in place for a long time to do with um, something to do with climate, but a lot to do with sort of the Agenda 21 ideas, reducing CO2 and how we're going to transform the planet. These, these are pre-existing ideas that are now joining up because we have, in the last few months, we had a radical change to the way planning for housing works, right? So you, you're going to be able to turn old warehouses and businesses, you know, think of all the failed companies now, but right? you're going to be able to take all of these old business sites and change those into housing. And you don't need planning permission stuff. You can just turn them into micro apartments. And some of these are tiny, like eight, I think it's 18 meters square, and they don't need to have windows. Mm -hmm. and, and there'll be no green space. So there's no requirement to build green spaces or the usual services you, know, you would put with a housing development, that those aren't needed. Um, and this is under Build Back Better. And as one of the journalists writing about it said, it's quite obviously going to be slums, that we're building these slums of the future and that we're going to be moving people into them under Build Back Better from coronavirus. So you, you can kind of see that people have been destroyed. They've lost their businesses. They're losing everything. And they're going to lose their houses. And the, and the government's going to step in with Build Back Better and stuff you in some little box with no windows. You know, welcome to that Build Back Better, brighter future, right? Yeah, what I'm like, uh, I'm curious about this idea that of... Um say if you were to theorize you know again where does it come from all of this mm -hmm. if you were to kind of go uh look at it logically is mm -hmm. it is it a group uh, and that's I mean, we would go there but it, say for example because humans were absolutely so unbelievably arrogant mm -hmm. we're so arrogant that we we think that we can fix that with which which we were born into the earth mm -hmm. Um, we're so arrogant to believe that we're other than it and we are yeah. this intelligent race, despite the fact that it would appear that we were born from it. But like, that's just part that that's, um, but there's the, in that arrogance then, where does that go? So a group of people mm -hmm. get together and believe, well, the world is shit. We, with our big influence and our wonderful intelligence, can make it so much better for everybody. Mm -hmm. But yeah. we're going to have to drag everybody kicking and screaming. Oh, yeah. An awful lot of people objecting to it. But we really know because we are the wise ones and they are the idiots we just have to follow. And so they have an idea then of what a utopia looks mm -hmm. like, maybe debt free, property free, you know, free health care for everyone. And that as long and everybody under this one one state right yeah. and so that's the premise that we will make this world better because we're yeah. so amazing this wonderful egoic mm -hmm. arrogance yeah. and, but then there's a single-minded pursuit mm -hmm. of that of a gathering but is it I, I you know and that you could say that that is where it could potentially go if you're to go ch -ch -ch -ch, well a world that is appears the government is going to give you all the money. You're going to, you're, you're never, you won't have to pay a mortgage anymore. You can work or not work, and you get a basic income. You can do what you want, but you you need that you will have to follow under this yeah, these 1984 rules. style. Mm -hmm. We're theorizing now, obviously. Sure. But well, I'm yeah. trying to understand is that where it comes from? But any idea of a utopia, of course, is going mm -hmm. to be screwed and skewed into dystopia because that's not life. It's not. No. It's not life, life. Life is no. everything. You can't pack everyone into a one, you know, a one type of box. You know, it, it doesn't work. So, but what we do seem to see here is the 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 tendrils of Agenda Twenty One, really, throughout all of this. But the system that we're moving into really is a technocracy. You know, it's a kind of corporatocracy slash technocracy because it, it's mostly corporate control. And if you look at the people that are involved. You know, the higher level, say the World Economic Forum, who've been particularly one of these, you know, non-governmental kind of think tanks that's been 
unifying a vision for the future. I mean, it's not the only one, but of course, in the last few months, it's taken on a prominent role. But there's many of these, you know, out there where you know business leaders and lead, you know world leaders get together and they have their conversation about where they feel the world should go. And of course, out of these these think tanks and meetings come ideas that are spread everywhere. And that's why we see things like build back better being in Canada, you know, Europe and Australia, that they go back to their own nations and they implement these ideas, right? So it's not conspiratorial in the sense that, in the crazy sense, it's just a conspiracy in that, yes, people do meet up in mountain hotels, have private conversations about how they want the world to be and take those ideas back out and implement them. So in that respect, you could say that they are conspiring to change your life, okay? So yes, there is a conspiracy in that sense because these are powerful people with influence who are able to go away and actually implement whatever ideas they all agree in these meetings. Now, people can look at that as either just the normal workings of the world or as a dark conspiracy, that, that's up to them. But the reality is that we can now see that they are bringing us into a technocracy, which is essentially a system that doesn't require the, the kind of traditional leadership we think of as, as presidents and prime ministers and kings and queens, that instead it's a, a system run largely by bureaucrats, scientists and engineers that utilize artificial intelligence and technologies to make the system kind of flow flawlessly. So you'd have, you know, the idea is to have these AI cities where everything is fed through an AI hub. You know, you have your smart grid electronics, you have your internet of things, you know, attached to your smart fridge and your smart toaster and your smartphone. And they're all wired through these, you know, fast 5G networks, which they, they hope to transit to 6G as quickly as they can. But initially 5G networks, which you don't need for the speed of your internet, but they need for this bandwidth of data of collecting all of this information from all these smart technologies, right? It's running your smart car, you know, which will be driven around the city for you by its autonomous AI unit feeding back into a city hub. You know, so in their mind, there's this vision, this kind of a you know, brave new world. This technology is finally, you know, at the point where it can step forward and it can take over all the burdens of the human mind and of the human body. You know, everything will be done. You know, we can think it for you wholesale type situation where we really don't need you to really worry about things anymore. Technology can handle it. Right. Um, the problem with with this, one of the things you need, if you want AI that can do all this is you need a lot of data. Now, where are you going to get that data? Well, you, you get it from what's happening already in people's lives. You know, you need to feed that data into the AI so that it learns. So one of the stages we're at now, of course, is this need for essentially tracking and surveilling everything that everyone does, if possible. You know, as many people as you can hooked into that to feed into the AI. So this is why we have this kind of Orwellian surveillance stage at the moment where it's, they want to be able to track and trace everything you do. They want you online, they want your education online, your work online, your shopping online. So obviously shops have had to close, you know, funnily enough. So you want your shopping online, your schools have been at least temporarily put online and there are at any point there's children learning online because they're getting sent home, right? Mm. Because in these bubbles. So we, we have this amount of data that never used to flow through the system, all going in, being fed in, and it's teaching these AI systems everything about us. And that is essential to where this is going because they really do need that big data to mine through to get this system to do what they want it to do, right? And we, we also move into what's called, they're calling the su surveillance capitalism uh, and the data economy, where a lot of this, the actual infrastructure of the economic situation you know, will also be built around data. You know, we've heard about this idea, data as the new oil, you know, data as the new gold, because your data is worth so much to these companies and to these tech companies that really they, they'll give you all these apps they'll give you all these programs for free as long as they can harvest your data because this is you know this again is essential to this new infrastructure that's being put in right mm. now people can say well maybe this is progress maybe this is a good thing you know and i can't tell people what to think but what it brings with it of course is an astonishing level of invasion into your privacy and a level of, of data mining from you and your family that is just mind-bending really you know your, your children's activities being 
fully kind of monitored through interactive technologies, you know, giving tablets out to kids because they want to be able to know what kids like, what they do, what they think, and try to plot where they're going to go. Even I saw some information say they, they want to be able to know when they're still in primary school, what job that they're going to be good for, you know, almost that pre-selecting where you're going to be in life based on things they're doing when they're five and six years old, you know, deciding, are you an alpha? Are you a beta? Or will you just be a delta? You know, but knowing it early on. So there's, there's these kind of really dystopian aspects to this data mining in our children's lives, particularly. But all of us are going to be impacted by that. And, you know, track and trace and all these ideas are to get us used to being surveilled openly, you know, not just covertly, where it used to be covert. Now we're being asked to just accept that a normal, healthy society is one that is totally surveilled with AI cameras and heat sensors, facial recognition. You know, these, are, these will help you stay healthy and they're also helping build this wonderful world where you can sit back and let the computers handle it. Yeah, and uh, you don't need to get too conspiratorial. You know, you can, uh, and most things are hidden in plain sight. So you believe, yeah. if you believe that you are choosing who your government is, you okay but you do have to admit if you're um that if cnn and the guardian and the bbc told you that they loved x and y and z you do have to admit very very strongly that that would have a big influence and if you heard continuous positive stories mm -hmm. about donald trump um over the last four years you'd have to admit that that might impact your decision making mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, no matter who you are, if you're, you know, you would have to admit that you were absolutely an influence. And, it's, and we might not like to admit that our, our apparent free will and decisions are and not influenced. We might not like to see that, but there's no doubt about it. And we go everywhere to look to validate wherever we get an opinion from and we'll dismiss, I mean, all, whatever that psychological thing is, that, that is what appears to happen. And that's fine. But... You can, if you want to ask, well, uh, are the news people independent? Mm -hmm. if you, or are they, have they somebody else mm -hmm. uh, telling them what's important to say and not important to say? Uh, and you can ask that question without being conspiratorial in any way, shape or form. You don't have to imagine that there's reptilians uh, in the Go background back mm -hmm. trying to influence these mm -hmm. news media outlets to, no, don't you know, it's don't just, need, no, you don't need that. No, you don't need to. Yeah. You know, you don't. And your own influence might. Somebody is well groomed and they appear political. Then you might go, sure, he's nice enough there, and he hasn't. Mm -hmm. There's no um, scandals about him. I'm going to vote for him, and mm -hmm. whatever. So we can imagine that we are influenced by our external environment, whatever way, shape, or form. That's that's at a top level. But then but, when we go, go on. Sorry. No, I was going to say. Well, I mean. If they didn't think that, there wouldn't be this current st astonishing level of kickback against anti-vaccine media, would there? I mean, so clearly it's seen as that we are influenced very strongly, even by a, a small level of coverage of a topic like vaccination, because we've seen the, the astonishing level of concern the government have about us seeing any media that is anti-vax. So they obviously are very certain that the media influences us you know, very profoundly. Yes. Yeah, and it is, and it is the case. And then, if you take what you know, you take your media outlets, and then you combine the level of influence that the tech companies have now in terms of mm -hmm. um, what they censor, mm -hmm. the fact checkers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I had never been fact checked in anything in my life, and it's happened four or five times now mm -hmm. in recent. Um, it's amazing. My my podcast is obviously quite small, but um, I, I think the people who are interested in my um, in my account saw that I did one with Ivor, and I don't think even Ivor shared it. But it, it it went out to a certain point and then stopped. You know, yeah. but I, I know the people who would follow my account would probably be curious. Well, what's the angle here? Mm -hmm. he, not like him to do a subject like this. Why is he doing that subject? And there was, you know, but it, it, it's the level to which you would have thought in a healthy society, 
it would be, oh, okay, somebody wants to know why they should vaccinate. Can we have a conversation and give them all the absolute best reasons as to why, as opposed to going, you're an anti-vaxxer, far right, da, 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 da. you know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, we're starting to understand the incredible level of control these tech companies and media giants really do have in our thinking that, you know, let's say they've managed to shape our perception of the US president almost entirely because, you know, obviously in Europe, we're not, we don't live under Donald Trump, right? So we wouldn't normally think a lot about what it's like to have him as a leader or anything like that. But we, we've had a continual feed for the last few years of how terrible he is, you know, and how much we should hate him. And to the point where people in, you know, in Europe were running around with banners about, you know, anti-Trump and so, and he's not even our leader, you know, it, it was, to an absurd level, and it shows that it does impact us a lot, that people were willing to go out and campaign against Donald Trump in Europe, where it really isn't our business. Almost crying leader. with relief when he was kicked out. Crying, yeah. lots of people crying with relief Yes, that he was yeah. kicked out. And Astonishing. <laughs> Astonishing. Because he was no, look, well, look at look at Bush, you know, someone who dragged us you know, into a wars in, in Iraq and stuff. Um, very unpopular, I would say, a pretty unpopular president. Certainly in Europe was seen as an unpopular president. But there was never that level of media ridicule or attack of Bush, even though he was really kind of came across as an imbecile. He was horrendous. Now, he was horrendous. I, yes, I he was remember, horrendous. I, I remember though, he was seen. I remember when he was kicked out and Obama get, got in, it, there was a similar sort of kind of hysteria that. Here's hope again, after having that idiot in government who couldn't string a sentence together again, and mm -hmm. it was repeated, his few, you know, he said, fool me, whatever he's, you know that, those yeah. sort of things was played everywhere. And then it suddenly we've, stops. Up. We've never had this level of- No, never had this level. Never totally had this good. level of it. No. Of, of really ridiculing a US leader. And to the point where the, the people in the US all ridiculing their own lead, well, a large segment, you know, over half the country ridiculing the leader, instead of saying, well, you know, he's our president, we have to get on with it, which seems to be usually their attitude. But this time it's been really it's been denied. insane. And, and really also, insane. they're all wretched. Yeah. They're all wretched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every one of them are wretched. Yeah. They, yeah. I mean, there's, not, there's no empathy and love at all in an inch of them. No. Uh, they, uh, they wouldn't know it if it came up and pit them on the ass. Really, mm -hmm. they just wouldn't know. No. Uh, what to do because they have to protect their own reputations but we've definitely seen yeah this the power of, of media the power of social media um the tech world's influence on us and that's why i think you know we can sort of say people can say well does what i'm saying sound like a conspiracy you know we're moving into this technological world well not really i mean again you can look at the arrow of where we are where we've been and the direction it's heading and and see that that is really where it, it is going towards this high-tech civilization i mean that's again it's it's in the promotional material you know if people pick it up and read it you know i mean it's this isn't sort of conspiracy madness or you know you can go out and you can look at what these companies are announcing as their next plans you can see that the ai cameras and the ai systems and and this online schooling with virtual teachers and so, you know all of that is being built at the moment i mean it's it's there i mean it's not that's why i mean it, it, the thing but is, that's what I mean. I'm, 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 I'm there with you too because it isn't. Uh, I, I like to kind of just look and see well, what for the facts and look at the information mm -hmm. and kind of go and decide. Yeah. Or, or need not even decide. Go okay. Well, that's all that information there. And mm -hmm. okay, it seems to be this way, and mm -hmm. it seems to be already the case. The influence, even for example, on my Twitter feed, it shows me. It kind of keeps Frank now in this new box of people who are against uh, lockdown. And so I get all that, that sent, and it's happy, in a way it's kind of, just keep Frank over there, and mm -hmm. you know, they can all self-reference, and blah, 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 keep them in their box there. And likewise, what I do anywhere else, it's the same sort of, you know, it's kind of positioned as, or, or somehow boxed, the technology is boxed, what I receive in, and who it goes out to. Mm -hmm. the, Oh, know. absolutely. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons why here we've um, been trying to do physical action to do with the anti-lockdown and stuff, because it's easy to think, you know, in terms of your social media and online world that, you know, you're against something, you know, you're sharing the ideas between people, you're against something. But 
you're not really reaching those other people that maybe are on the fence or that don't agree with you because you are channeled into your own little virtual bubbles. And, um, and that, of course, is a problem with social media that it does. It shows you what you want to see generally. Yeah. Now, when you go out, then you have to actually physically, you know, engage with people. Like we took flyering and um, a rally and some on street forums to talk to those other people who you just you wouldn't reach otherwise. There's no dialogue with them through your computer anymore. Um, and to get that more of an idea of what's it like in your own community, you kind of have to go back to the old thing of physically going out and talking to people, you know, and getting a sense of what does my local community think about this? You know, are they educated on it? Are they aware of these problems? I mean, you know, are they enthusiastic to go into a new normal where we just have all these restrictions forever? You know, um, and we've definitely felt that we need to be going back to low tech with this. We need mm. to be thinking about how much we want this to be, you know, just built around this, the, the technology that are owned by the, the very technocrats and Silicon Valley people that have kind of caused, you know, an awful lot of problems. You know, do we want to rely on that to then fix the situation? I, I think we can't. I think that, that if we're going to be calling any of this into question, a large part of this conversation has to happen back in the physical world. You know, with people actually going out, engaging and organizing educational events and seeing if people understand the risks of taking, a, you know, experimental vaccines that don't do what they're supposed to. Do. And all of these things that are just not happening through the virtual world. Right. So that's a push that I think has come out of this over uh, reliance on technologies. We're starting to realize we, we've allowed that to creep too far into our lives and into our communities and that we need to, to question that because we can't say we're against a technocratic state but then continue to choose to live completely in our phones, right? Um, that we also have to take some personal responsibility because, you know, I, I probably overly use technology myself. And then the yeah. question, should I be doing <laughs> Same that? Same as that. Right, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I kind of it both ways. I have to question then, you know, I'm, am I part of that shaping a new culture that is built around children growing up living in their iPad? you know oh, yeah. um, I mean it's a constant struggle in a way I mean I have three kids so it's mm -hmm. um, but I went to this um, rally on Saturday in Ireland and Dolores Scal spoke at it now it had a sort of political feeling to it it was called the Irish Freedom Party they put up the Irish flag there's kind of a reference to republicanism and there's that kind of energy going to of people who will turn up to any kind of rally, if you know what I mean, there, and mm -hmm. which is not dismissive, but that was the kind yeah. of vibe mm -hmm. as opposed to, for me, this is, I mean, this is, this is there's no politics in this yeah. at all, but it, it, this is simply an idea of uh, back the fuck up, back mm -hmm. the fuck away. You know get your hands out of my life here just you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so that's where i, I would go out and uh, you know onto the street for but it's it's interesting the in ireland the fact the organization is kind of just that political it, it almost gives it uh, there would be no media attention to it all the media attention then is just in the in the kind of smaller groups online mm -hmm. and again that's this juggernaut of a technology just squashing that right in here into that mm -hmm. little box it'll never get out really and yeah. if it does we'll just flag it Doosh. Yeah. two seconds yeah. do, 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 do. so you're right yeah. i mean but then when you see movements in germany and you see people walking together that's kind of powerful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely and I, I think that we need a combination of national movements like that where you see say in berlin you see people have obviously traveled to you know to get together to do that the same thing in london but I do think that it has to also be happening in the community. And I, I think that unlike, say, the Iraq war, where the best way to protest that was everyone getting together in huge numbers in capital cities around the world. And that's what happened, because, you know, you're trying to stop this problem somewhere off in Iraq, which you can't directly influence beyond showing your government, you know, absolute contempt. Right. But this, this is not really like that. This is something that's going to infiltrate into your community. You know, and that you're all going to have to live with it. You know, it'll be your local government reeling out these rules that are coming top down. And so you have to be able to also have, I think, protests and a movement in your village or in your town and calling on your yeah. local councillors and on your local MP and on your local, you know, infrastructure to say, well, are you going to be supporting this madness going forward? 
because, you know, we're going to try and push you out if you are. You know, you're, you're, the local council need to know we don't believe this or we're against this um, and we will push you out, you know, if we can, if you're going to support this. And you need to get those numbers, you know, if it's flyering or if it's doing a local radio or whatever it is, to let people know in your community that there's a lot of other people that don't agree with this. They're not on their own because there's obviously what we've had with the rule of six and isolation is a method of keeping people from talking to each other. Now, that's, mm. you can call me cynical, but as far as I'm concerned, these measures are almost entirely prevent the spread of dissent. Close the pubs, stop people talking over a pint in the pub, you know, and other people hearing it. Because if they hear you in there saying, you know what, we should chuck this government out, that's an idea that will spread faster than the virus. And that is what they're scared of. They're scared that if there's more than six of you and the pub's open, that very soon the community is going to be shifting towards, oh, turns out everyone else thinks that this is a scam. You know, I think they are scared silly of that happening. Absolutely scared silly of it. That if they can keep people at home thinking that, well, it's just me going crazy. You know, everyone else seems to agree. I must have gone bonkers, right? And I've met a lot of people now that have said that. They felt that they were, they were going crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're on their own thinking, what is this madness? You know, why, why, why don't I believe it? Why don't I feel like I need a mask and that I need, you know, and felt that they were going mentally ill, right? So, and then once they meet other people that are campaigning against lockdown locally, they, you know, it was like almost a, a psychological relief for them, first of all, just to realize that, you know, it's not just me. Yeah. Um, and I think the government has put these policies in place for that. I mean, there was some sage notes that were leaked because of, um, Simon Dolan's campaign against the government and he managed to get some sage notes released and in there it did say that some of these things about restrictions on um, the, the protesting and stuff it was more it was to do with concerns about lockdown dissent and they were they, they were quite openly with saying we may need to put some in place some rules in case of people you know pushing get, back on this and getting right. rowdy at night I mean I think is it Julie from is it talk radio over there is it Julia She's yeah, oh a, yeah, Hartley Brewer, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, she said, she was asking, I think, Michael Gove, an MP, is it Michael Gove, somebody Gove? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She said, how does the virus know whether I'm standing up or sitting down? Or mm -hmm. I have a plate of chips beside my pint? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And his answer was just the most pathetic thing. I mean, it, it's, it's an interesting two minutes to see how pathetic, mm -hmm. really, when it's presented. And then, you know, what's, what comes then is the fear. Really, yeah. the, the default is, well, what if this was to get out of control? Yes. We need to control it. Yeah. Right. The, the thing is, what they're really scared of, as say, to get out of control is dissent. I mean, all of these rules, if people look at it logically, the rule of six is arbitrary. Of course, it's arbitrary. There's no science to say that six people gathering is better than eight or two. or You know, these are arbitrary. It's just, it's just a small number, approximately the size of a family, right? So you approximate a slightly larger than average family. So you say six, okay? Um, and then you say in the pub, heads down, eat your dinner, don't talk to the other tables. You know, you can have a meal and then bugger off, right? So again, all of these things are restrictions on you having a larger community to talk with, to share ideas with, right? That, that's what they function as, all of them. Now, there's, there's nothing in these rules that connects to health. You know, 10 o'clock, you've had your beers, go home, sod off. You know, again, nothing to do with how viruses spread. No, nothing in there at all about epidemiology or virology, right? They just seem like arbitrary, psychological, you know, psyop type thinking from some behavioral insights team. You know, what's the minimum number that we, we need it to be so that ideas don't spread too fast and so that it's basically families isolated to themselves um, more or less, and, and they've come up with this framework, right? Uh, I don't think anyone at this point pretends that this is to do with a scientific method to stop a virus, you know, because of, clearly it's, it's not. It doesn't make any sense. In that it's, an, it's an idiot's guide. It would be an idiot's guide. So then you have to look at it. What does it do? Well, it functions very well to break up a community that would share ideas. If, if for that, it functions very well. Because, you know, you would be in the pub overhearing other groups otherwise saying, you know what, I don't think this is real, things like that. And that would make people think, wouldn't it? If you were sitting at your table, you're having your beer, and you hear another couple nearby having a chat over a pint, saying, yeah, I think this is bollocks. I think that this is an attack on us. Right? That idea, even if you had never thought it before, you'd think, why is someone else saying that? Yeah, you would. You would hope, what's, yeah. Yeah, what's going on here? You know, 
And if someone else perks up in the corner over their beer and says, you know what, I think we need to chuck these people out, you know, it, it would start to spread so fast. And that is what they are scared silly of. I tell you now, that's what they're scared of the pubs. They keep going for the pubs, trying to shut them down and limit what you can do there and cut the times. Because that is the hub of the community, right? Across, you know, I'd say across the UK and Ireland, it's, you know, the hub of the community is the pub. And that's where they've really focused on getting those limited or shut down. And they're hoping they collapse. That's the hope that they just collapse in the next few months, right? Um, and they have lockdown now in their arsenal. Because this has been allowed, not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. And look at Scotland and Wales, where you have pubs where you're not allowed to drink. You can go to the pub, but you have to just have a glass of Coke and a sandwich. Yeah, What's that about? But the phenomenon of that is somehow, as a, a, a somehow, as opposed to going, no, I'm going to go for a pint now, so there's nothing you can do about it. It's the, it would require courage to do that somehow, and that's not easy, you know. It, uh, but why? It's somehow if people have been backed into a corner for it to require a protest against something yeah. to go and yeah. do, as opposed to you go if you want to go, yeah. you stay at home, and you, the government, do a good job looking after the the care homes that you have not done heretofore, mm -hmm. you know. But in governance. You see, the idea that the government work for the people has long since died. Yeah. You know, that's not been the case ever, really, in our lifetimes anyway. No, Even no. though there's a kind of a pretense that they do, they absolutely do not. No. The, the, underneath the government, those civil servants and other bureaucrats do all the work, right? The, the country runs because of them. I mean, we have to... We have to sort of accept that it's not the MPs that are really doing the work, you know, that these are people that represent corporate interests for the most part, their own interests and corporate interests. And, you know, obviously influence what the, the lower level bureaucrats do, but really they're not the ones running the country or making anything work. I mean, if we fired them all tomorrow, would the health service collapse? No, would it help? Because it's not them doing the work, leading these systems, right? You know, they, they come up, with well debate the policies but i think we give too much of a uh, you know importance to them almost like you know what would we do if they all were fired tomorrow we'd collapse and it's like well no we wouldn't we wouldn't because those other people would still go to work that run the nhs or that you know or the run the trains you know they'd still be at work doing what they did the day before right um and i, I think people don't really sort of think that through and think well yeah they're not actually that important you know not really we we, we could do without them tomorrow and come up with another system, you know, in the meanwhile, you know, because um, they have they have long since departed and become corporate interest groups um, with, you know, huge shareholdings in the things that they're doing and all this. We've seen that all throughout this crisis, you know, the, the level of, of uh, influence that they have on them, the self-interest and the cronyism, you know, giving out contracts to their friends and stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's in plain sight. The it is in plain sight, yeah. You don't need to go look far. And it, it is, like, when you talk about the civil servants, I also think it's, it is in the, the most, in lots of the cops. I, I, I would say, you know, the seed, we kind of talked about the seed. Either this, if this seed is kind of in you where you're kind of going, well, I don't know, I'm not so, but you, you might just be that way anyway about lots of things, and it's kind of there. It's in you if you're a cop too. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. It goes across the political sphere and it goes across all of the... You're, it's either in you, that kind of going, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I hear what you're saying, but I don't mm -hmm. necessarily believe you. And so it's so cops then have to go and enforce something. Some of them are kind of going, hmm. And yeah. they want to go for a pint somewhere and go, I don't agree with this. I, wa yeah. I want to be going to stop and people breaking into houses. Yeah. I want to go and stop racial attacks down the road mm -hmm. or I want to be doing something useful. I don't want to be stopping ordinary businessmen uh, mm -hmm. tattoo uh, mm -hmm. parlours having to come out and you know I don't know if you saw that guy who I thought was brilliant uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, somewhere in England yeah you know, Bristol. was it Bristol I don't know who that guy was but a man I just loved mm -hmm. his presence mm -hmm. and standing there and knowing his rights mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a rare, it's a beautiful thing to see where somebody mm -hmm. is going, yeah, you're, you're breaking the law now by doing this. Mm -hmm. Back up. Um, just briefly, I have to, I'm going to have to get the charger because my phone's running out of battery. It's going to 
That's cool. We've, 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 we've had a good one. <laughs> yeah, give me a second. Um, I'll swap onto the computer so we can finish up on there. Is that okay? Yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go my wife's it. finishing the office now. So All right, nice one. It just means a change of background, though. Yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> Hey. It's you on your side, I think. Yeah, Hello. You're, you're back in the game. Okay, and hello. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Hi. Okay. No. Got you. Right. Sorry to make sure on the right speakers. Super. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I've had to change background. Be grand. I see. I see that. Good. Cool it background there. Like I've, it makes me look like I've. Know, teleported or something, but um, I'll make it yeah, look sorry. like that. Just get you, I should have got you to go like that. Do one of those thingies. Yeah. Are, you, are you okay if you um, pick, pick up from where we were at? Yeah, if you can remember. Um, so we were just saying about oh, the guy in Bristol. Oh, yes, that's yeah, yeah, and sticking up for your rights and being able yeah, to, yeah, knowing your rights and being aware of it and kind of going. It, this is and being aware that this is guidance, but it's you know, and and people should know this is guidance. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily is it law. That's the vagueness I don't understand. Is this you know? Well, again, we've had um, a lot of this is is so such psychological manipulation. You know, again with this the behavioural insights being involved, the understanding how to manipulate us without having to really bring in law in some cases just making us feel like we have to do stuff so some, some of the things are laws some are guidelines but then there's also pre-existing protections that we have that we don't really understand like you know that if you were to be running a business and i want to shut you down i'm coming from the local government you don't have to invite me in you know for a start you can just say that you know i would consider that trespass if you come onto my private property and that you know, and the other thing you notice is they often they'll ask you to come out. You know, people come out and get arrested. But if you if you stand on your own territory and say no, I don't want you coming in, um, then suddenly you have all kinds of rights because they haven't got, you know, they haven't got a warrant normally to go into your building. Right? Which is again, these are, I mean, a lot of people say you know, using old laws, you know, trying to Magna Carta and all sorts of things you, you really aren't appropriate. But if you just stuck with the normal laws that we have, you know that unless the police have a warrant to come into your property, that they have no rights to come in and arrest you. You know, there's all these kind of things that I think people are not aware of, that you could make it very difficult for local government just by saying, no, I don't want you coming in, thanks. Fuck yeah. off. I, but I think that awareness to know, uh, or that, you know, that you, there is a certain amount of power available to you to go, and you see, it's seen as protesting. How mm -hmm. is being a little bit aware of your own freedoms protesting? So it's protesting to say, sorry, you're not allowed to come into my house with a, without an official warrant. Is that mm -hmm. protesting? How would it be protesting? It's not protesting. Yeah, it's tre treated like it. No, it's not. It's, it's you sticking up yourself with your own rights. And I saw a guy, they showed a guy a takeaway, I think somewhere in Manchester or something, and he was doing that. He said, look, I'm not going to 
contract with you. I, I don't want you in here. I consider you as trespassing. Yes. I want you to leave. And th they, they didn't do anything. He said, I'm not giving my name. I haven't done any crime. You know, I don't want to give you my name and details. And, and so they couldn't find him. They had no basis to arrest him. The council people weren't even allowed in the building because he said, you know, you're trespassing, get out. Um, and again, you start to realize we do have those protections in law. And it, if everyone was to do that tomorrow, the businesses, they couldn't do anything about it. No, they couldn't yet. Yeah. It's just been aware of your own, you know, your own, what's, what's too far for you? Mm -hmm. What is too far? Maybe too far is them in your house and a camera in your house. Maybe that's your, your final point, but it's probably too late then. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was surprised as well, because look, if you have, say, a pub and it's failing because of this, which a lot of pubs are. Now, what's the difference between me going bankrupt because the government won't let me trade or me going bankrupt because the government's slapping fines on my company for trading? I mean, there's a point there where I would feel like, well, what's the difference? This company's over, right? Yeah. So you might as well trade. and You get might as well prison. go first. Yeah. Yeah. Go if my prison. life was dependent on it. Yeah, your family's I, depending on it. What would you I do? would be trading. I'd be trading. And yeah. you see, and for those who wouldn't want to come because they're worried, I'd go, fair enough. But I'm going to serve you pints. You can come in and get some pints. Yeah. <laughs> and I sort of hinted this on a page. There's a pub page here, a Facebook page. And I said, look, there's a lot of us just waiting for one of you to give us the nod that, you, yeah. <laughs> that we can come in, have a few drinks with no masks and no distancing and... And, and if they did that, you know, they would be one of the most popular pubs in town. I think they like would, yeah. Mm. So there's an opportunity for somebody just to say bollocks to this, you know. Isn't it funny that it does require uh, uh, that? It requires uh, those, and it requires somehow a swell to get behind that one, mm -hmm. you know, or, or some sort of an overreaction. Yeah. Uh, you know, there, we've already seen people who's who are in tears because their business is closed, and they're 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 out protesting because their business is being closed and the devastating impact of that. And that has been, I think, they're arrested now. You, you know, you only see snippets; you don't know where they're throwing something or. But you would have said, "Well, that's a good enough reason to protest. Your government yeah. is ruining your business. I think it's okay. You need to shout from the rooftops." But yeah, mm -hmm. which are the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's extraordinary. People are going to the point of suicide. You know, they're they're letting their their business be totally destroyed by the government. And you know, very tragically, some of these people are either attempting, you know, or successfully attempting suicides. You know, because they've lost everything. Um, now, again, there's that thing in the back of your head, isn't it? Of, of why haven't we got a switch somewhere that says enough's enough? You know, you're yeah. looking at your balance book. I'm going to be, you know, at the wall and I don't think I'll be able to take it. But then there has to be a bit where you say, well, I'm not going to let the government put me there. Yeah. Right? Because otherwise, well, what have you achieved? You know, if it's that you've gone bankrupt and now you're trying to blow your brains out. I mean, what, what did it going along with it achieve? You know, there has to be a bit. I think some of these people have to stop and think there's another way here. That if I was and it's way, say, I totally agree. And it's way closer than you think this solution you're the solution not yeah. not anywhere else you are the solution to this and you're you have to it and I, it seems to be either that seed is growing where some people go no and then the other seed of total compliance and head down and the must be the government must be right that's the polarity mm -hmm. the one is kind of going oh okay no 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 you know, I think that's fascinating, and people mm. will. It won't. It won't. I, I do have a kind of a naive sort of an optimism that people may go. Mm -hmm. That may go, but this is a so. journey. I mean, it's, it's um. Well, I mean, there's definitely people that are starting to, but I, I think what we've seen is it's well here. Yeah, I think we've seen it's more up in the north. I mean, there hasn't. There's some. I say obviously that tattoo artist down in Bristol, but I think that looking at the businesses that have stayed open. I mean, my local area, I'm not aware of anyone, you know, in my town that's done that, that's kept their business going. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a bit higgledy-piggled, isn't it? One shop in one town, you know, one business in another city, and it, it doesn't seem there's a concerted effort, you know, yeah. where you'd say, okay, 
We've got several shops and pubs in town that have said no. And they're going to back each other up and we're going to say, look, no, the council needs to come up with something better. We're not willing to all go bankrupt. Um, and to really, yeah, just say no. Just It's that simple. To be honest, the whole thing goes away, all of this, if we just say no, like we stop complying. Yeah, right? this is an acceptable solution. You need to do yeah. something about the healthcare. You need to do something about it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you put in the basics. And again, also address the fact that in, in terms of the virus, because obviously underlying this, businesses are scared. People will say, well, you're letting it spread. You know, if you open, you're breaking the guidelines and you're letting the virus rip through and all this, you know, it's all this jingoism has been put. But again, that's where they have to be informed in themselves to be able to say, well, no, actually, I know that, the, that this isn't the case, that what we're seeing is people in hospitals at the normal levels for this time of year, that there is no evidence of some crazy epidemic because, I mean, they say in October, in our 2019 versus 2020, we had eight more deaths in, the, in England this October. Eight more deaths. I saw you posting that, yeah. Week, right? So where is this crazy epidemic that's killing all these people, right? If there's eight more. And we, this week, we had the Daily Mail saying, you know, they interviewed uh, the guys in the health system. Or they come up, the stats are that there's four hospital trusts that are, that are busier than last year. Four across the whole country. I mean, so this is not evidence of an epidemic, right? So again, I think businesses have to be educated enough to be able to say, when someone says, well, you know, there's this epidemic, say, no, there's not. Yeah, you know, where would you get that? I, I, where you get that information? Because this is a juggernaut. That's, a, the, you know, it's a really good point. Because if mm -hmm. you want an alternative view to the main media, you really have to go look. And, yes. yeah. and it's instantly a classification of that's fake news or far right or some yes. whatever. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, I, I've never felt anything that's such a, a juggernaut. I mean, it's humongous. This is a literal beast without getting going down that path. <laughs> you know the path I'm talking about, but it is a beast in terms of the size of it. It, I, is, I, it absolutely yeah. is. And again, that's where I know we touched on earlier, but the, the Agenda 21, I know people don't like that because now that's getting spun as though Agenda 21 is a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same way that the World Economic Forum saying that they're involved in this is being spun as a crazy conspiracy. Now, this is an Orwellian situation of double thing because we can also read the news where it's saying, you know, Klaus and the World Economic Forum are calling for a great... I mean, look, it was on the front of Time magazine. The Great Reset was on the front of Time magazine. Right? So, but then we're also told it's a conspiracy theory. So you're not even allowed to believe your own lying eyes where they're and, telling you. And the problem with it is if you go down the road of that in terms of kind of um, trying to position an alternative viewpoint to somebody, it's instantly dismissed as that. As opposed to, are you okay with this, the freedoms, that your freedom has been impacted? Are you sure? And, you know, have you noticed how much it's changed? And that it's, and you know, for something that is a medium age uh, of mortality of 82 with underlying conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with that? This is death is not new. No. <laughs> Get busy living. Sure, sure, Can't stay at home till nobody dies. This idea isn't it that just stay at home till nobody dies. I yeah. mean, like, ah, so I have to stay at home forever then. You know, mm. it's, it's, it's this really, I don't even know if it's ignorance or again with the brainwashing, it's really hard to really balance it up because it seems that they're not you know, to think for themselves that the idea of, well, when does that end then? Because if it has to get to zero people dying for you to go out. And at the same time, where that makes even less sense is people aren't registering how many people are still at work while you're in a lockdown because the country has to function, right? So the lockdown, maybe to them, they feel it's like everyone has to stay home. Okay, so what about the warehouse workers? What about the food, you know, production people? What about the bus drivers? What about the train drivers? What about the civil servants? What about, so in the end, you've got millions of people who are still at work. So if there's an epidemic, it's spreading through those millions of people who are at work, right? The whole time, throughout the whole of this, those millions of people have been at work. The ones who've been at home is a few shopkeepers, the school for a bit, you know, and you know, they call non-essential jobs, but all the rest of the people have been at work. So there's this very strange kind of, 
ignore choosing to ignore the obvious that you can't actually but shut it, but it's, it's, down. it's not reported it's, it's not no. like it's like for example the retail the large retail outlets there's an article that published uh, that said that um basically a COVID didn't spread in the retail outlets and that would have been people who are working every day in with the great unwashed you know what I mean? They're in with everybody coming in, half doing the job, washing their hands, and they're surrounded by that. And yet COVID didn't spread. No, no. And I asked people, I used to ask them in the supermarkets, I made a point of asking the till people, you know, has anyone in your team, you know, been off with this? And no. You know, one guy said, you know, you didn't get those plastic guards till quite late on, you know. And he was like, oh, well, it would only go around it and into my face, wouldn't it? You know, and he said, they, they could understand that this was absurd. And, you know, they weren't, I talked to a young lad the other day and I said to him, well, I see you've survived the apocalypse of frontline workers. And he was just laughing and he said, you know, I don't wear a mask. I'm not, because the company keeps telling me I have to. He says, but I know it doesn't do any good. And, he was, and I said to him about, well, the flu's gone. This year. And he said, yeah, they've just shifted it across, haven't they? So, I mean, he knew. Yeah, these people, the flu thing as well. Well. And, there, and he knew, right? So, they're not so they're obviously any- getting that feedback from somewhere though, you know, it's coming, they're seeing it somewhere or somebody is saying something like a little small sentence like, it's funny about flu not being reported mm-hmm. as much, isn't it? Or so is they're it- aware, because they've been there the whole time, people saying bits and bits, and also thinking, of, why aren't we getting sick with the frontline workers? Like you said, they're aware of it. They understand that they've got people coming up to them all day, thousands of people they're dealing with a week, and that they're not going off with COVID. So it's it's... Where is it? You know, you're not seeing people coughing and spluttering. We're not seeing any of that. You know, the tangible evidence of an epidemic just isn't there. Because mm-hmm. e- even if someone is sick, let's be honest, in the current climate, if you had a really bad cough, you wouldn't bother going to the shops because it's so uncomfortable. If it's so uncomfortable, people be looking at you like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> if, they, if you cough, I mean, nobody wants to cough at all. The fear of coughing and being an outcast. So what mm-hmm. is it going to be like then if you somehow go in terms of being an outcast and you decide not to take the vaccine and yet the pressure is going to be phenomenal. Oh man, it's for, for you and for I and for our families and to, mm-hmm. to take this is going to be like nothing I think oh, we've absolutely. ever seen. Absolutely. Because, you know, if you look in Australia, they're usually ahead of the curve. You know, we lived in, my wife's Australian and we lived in Australia for a while. But, you know, they had already got to the no vax, no um, kindergarten, you know, no vax, no um, wow. benefits. You know, they were doing that before this. Now, it's, they were the first ones now to announce that it could be no vax, no job, no vax, no travel. Qantas has started off with the no vax, no flying on their planes. You know, Australia seems to be the, where they test this stuff. Right? They see, what can you get away with? Now, if they're going to be wheeling out there, they're going to be wheeling out here. And so if you have a no job, no benefits, a no job, no job, no job, no education, no job, no travel. I mean, you can say it's not mandatory, but I mean, how does a man live if he has no benefits, no job? Yeah, you know? and it's perfect for the government because they can go, I mean, the why, why do they need it all? Because you see, it's endless. If everybody takes the vaccine now, it's still going to be okay. Well, the virus mutated you need to take another vaccine and it, this is endless the control it is endless yeah. it's absolutely endless and it may yeah. be you take multiple vaccines as well they're not really being clear on that because they said well maybe some work differently to others so you might have to have this one from pfizer this one from oxford you know and then some of them are two doses and then they're not sure but they think maybe you might need them every year you know so you can see straight away they're opening up it could be an, you know, an unlimited number of injections for you already just from that with several injections a year possibly, right? But that, it doesn't end there because if you look closer at the, the, um, the sort of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and again, this connects back into the World Economic Forum, Agenda 21 and all this stuff, they're, they're quite open. I don't know if you've seen recently, they've all started wearing these pins with the 17, a circle with 17 colors on it. A lot of the leaders have wheeled out these, these badges. Now, those, those colours on that circle, those represent the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are under the UN Agenda um, 21 stuff, right? Which basically, the funny thing there is 14 of the 17 SDGs involve either directly or indirectly vaccinations. Now, isn't, isn't that funny? 
that 14 of 17 of their core goals involve mass vaccinations. And, and here we are having it wheeled out to us that everybody in the world needs to get on board with this vaccine program that is just going to keep going on and on. And if you look closer, it's because a lot of these goals involve the access to people that, is, that comes from having these vaccine programs. And then you can do all sorts of other things with them. Because if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be in their community vaccinating anyway, you might as well be doing X, Y, Z, other projects that you wanted to do in that community. So it's always a door that opens for you to have an influence in the lives of everybody. And so this is why these are really a cornerstone of this larger Agenda 21. Now, I know people think certainly hear things like, well, Agenda 21, it's not just a non, it's a non-committed UN, you know, discussion from back in the 90s. And surely that's you know, not going to impact. It's like, well, yes, they, they didn't have to agree it in law. But the fact is, countries adopted it. So they've been wheeling out the Agenda 21 um, climate related policies for years. I mean, and this is just, this is sort of one of those, but unfortunately it's one that really is, you know, kind of di dystopian because- It is it's, dystopian, it's, yeah. It is it's... dystopian. And it's gonna allow for ongoing vaccinations because there is no end. Once they say, look, if we have to have all this fuss for what is a mild coronavirus, a quite a mild coronavirus, you know, they can start selling these vaccines on everything. And the other problem is if it gets to a kind of a forcing you to have it, well, every drug that they think you need can then start to be forced upon you. You know, it, it opens that door where the pharmaceutical companies who we know have no morals. I mean, we've seen in the past that they're willing to sell flamidomide and stuff to people knowing that they would have, you know, children with horrific problems, right? So we know that. And we know that they sold the drugs on to third world nations after they couldn't sell them to us. So, I mean, these are not companies that you can say, well, they, they've got the moral high ground. Look at their history. You know, they've always been thinking of us. So we have to be very careful there that once we start saying that they can say, well, we need to take such and such a drug and it's no longer our choice, that essentially any of the medicines that they think are good for you could start to be forced on you. So you That's the inch that we talked about. You know, you move it, you move an inch. Can you move out of the way, Bruce? Can mm -hmm. you take this one? It's only one vaccine. You're only helping people. Just take the vaccine. Stop complaining. Yeah. Take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. You're just an anti-vaxxer. Just take this one vaccine. And mm -hmm. then you've, all, you've already moved. Mm -hmm. You've moved. Yeah. So then the next but time, that, it's even harder again to push back. Exactly. Because if you, well, you add that, what's the problem? Why are you complaining now? Yes. And then, yeah, you, you, that's it. You've already given. You've, you've seeded. You've moved. And the, um, I, I think um, it can come down to the... There is a possibility that this... Um, that a, a pub owner goes, well, I'm just going to open up. Mm -hmm. And somebody else follows him. And he tells people, look, I'm opening up for a pint. Uh, you can come in and um, I need the money. Well, yeah, and that's the start. Maybe that's other people would do the same. It, it and just, just total that. disregard. It does need a total disregard of it because, and, and not in a, it's not in a, a letting it rip. People, because once you understand that there is not the problem you've been sold, that you're basically in a marketing campaign for some, you know, dodgy vaccine because it doesn't have long term testing. I mean, I can happily say a dodgy vaccine because it hasn't had five to 10 years of testing, right? So we don't know what it does to you in a year's time. We don't know what it does in two years' time. Even if it was the greatest vaccine on the planet, you don't need it unless you're a no, certain age. You don't need it. Because and you, the, the hospitals will be able to manage now mm -hmm. anybody that comes in with it. And it's not tested on those people who we're saying it's for. You know, again, it doesn't do, it doesn't do what we thought it said on the tin. You know, it, it really doesn't because... Then you think so if it's not going to actually protect those people like if we don't know it even works on them right this has not been tested on them so we don't know it works for them and we know historically vaccines generally don't work for older people particularly and also older people with compromised immune systems usually can't take them and as you know that's always been the argument in the past we take it because they can't right we take them because they can't so now if we're saying we take it because they can't but it doesn't stop us passing the virus to them. What the hell is it doing for them? You know, if they do take it and it either doesn't work or it harms them, I mean, what, what, you know, is it, that's a head scratcher because we know that vaccines usually don't work on those people and they have compromised immune systems. So we can't give them these things that trigger their immune responses because it can kill them. You know, and that's why we don't usually give these vaccines and flu vaccines and stuff to people with underlying health conditions and stuff because 
you know, they, they could be dangerous for them. And also because we know that older people usually, it doesn't work very well because their immune response doesn't trigger the same as a younger person's. And so we've, we've known that. This isn't new science, you know what I mean? This is, we've known that. We've even had that argument put to us that we take it because others can't, right? So how the hell does that work in this situation then? If we're taking it because they can't and we can still spread the virus to them if we see them. I mean, you know, isn't that the emperor's new clothes to like an nth degree? I just... You know? uh, I mean, you're talking to the, you know, <laughs> you're talking to the converted. I mean, it is, it's... But it gets very abstract, doesn't it? It does get yeah. abstract. That, you know, you're taking this, you know, I suppose it's almost like saying that, you know, you've got a cut on you, we stick the plaster on, but your cut's on the leg and we'll stick it on your head, you know. It, it, it's just not helping. It's something, yeah, it's, it's, an in, it's an action to take, but it's not doing anything with the problem, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's saying, well, do this action. It doesn't cause any harm, you know. But yes, but it doesn't help, you know, and it's not on the problem. So the, if look, if there was an advert on tonight, let's be honest, if well, they, they've just said and they've rolled out, they've said today, great news, uh, this, this vaccine Great, has yeah. been okayed, right? They're going to start jabbing people in a few days time. They've rolled it out, they've said. Now, imagine if tonight on BBC News, on comes, you know, I don't know, Witty or Hancock or one of these maniacs, and they say, right, we just want to be quite clear with you, make sure you understand that we have removed the, you know, the right for you to sue these companies, that the companies have waived their normal five to 10 years of testing, that this could injure you in years to come. And we just want to make sure you understand that when we say 90% efficiency, we mean 90% efficiency in, in preventing some of the symptoms in healthy people, that there's no evidence that it will help, you know, vulnerable people and that it, doesn't stop you getting infected or spreading the virus. We just want to keep that clear. Yeah. From tomorrow, <laughs> you know, from tomorrow, the vaccine centers will be open. You're welcome to get one. You know, yeah. do you think there'd be queues tomorrow, the vaccine centers? Mm. I, I just, I can't see it. No, I can't, see it. I can't either. Nobody'd want it. Mm. Nobody. Um, uh, Bruce, I'm going to uh, bring our recording to a pause. I'm definitely, I'm, but I'm, I must, uh, after I press the pause on the recording, I'd just like to chat to you about something. But, I think uh, I want to chat to you again. I know we're going to um, uh, about some of your other areas of interest. So um, I'm just going to say, I'm going to thank you for um, your time now. I'm going to express the very much. Hi, if you like the conversation that I just had and you'd like more, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.